This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. In a time when new technological advances come at us every day, the world of the ancients can seem even more distant. What could we, with our smartphones and driverless cars, our 3D printers and satellite technology, possibly have in common with the ancient Egyptians, Greeks, or Romans? A great deal, as it turns out. You literally can't lock a door, take any kind of transport, or read something in the newspaper without paying a debt to the ancients. As long as there is a human race, these early footprints of civilization will remain. Modern marvels of architecture. Burj Khalifa in Dubai, the Shard in the city of London, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. They all impress with the scale of their physical size and the scale of their ambition. Some seem to defy gravity, while others seem like something lifted from the pages of a science fiction novel. Why do humans decorate? Why do humans design? Why do humans build? The good architecture and the kind of architecture that we're still talking about today from all these thousands of years ago, we marvel at the way they're built and the technological innovations and so on. But there's something much more than that that attracts us to them and it seems to be a rivalry perhaps with nature. First of all, it probably touches on an innate human desire and longing for something beyond this natural world, something metaphysical. If we speak about footprints of civilization, and especially in architecture and design, and focused on buildings mainly, or other structures made by man, we can compare, of course, the old structures, ancient structures, to the new ones. The White House, it looks like a palace. It has a monumental facade that makes it look like a temple. History Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans. With exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. Our extensive catalogue of documentaries covers everything from the rise of Hannibal Barker to the illustrious treasures of King Tut. So sign up today for broadcast quality documentaries uncovering the mysteries of the ancient world. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Odyssey fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code Odyssey at checkout. In this episode of Footprints of Civilization, we peel back the layers of time to discover that behind even the most space age of modern buildings, there's an incredible legacy that stretches back centuries. If we are in ancient times, in Egypt times, we can see that the pyramid was built for someone who was the number one in Egypt. It was a pharaoh. He was like a god. Their footprint 
is the idea of certainly power, but also the idea of aspiring to something beyond the physical, beyond the human. The Greeks turned that into something dynamic, something expressive that brought the supernatural, the metaphysical, the divine a little closer to humans. And the Romans were somehow able to combine the two, make the divine, the transcendent, the metaphysical incarnate that is allowing humans to perhaps feel themselves divine. The achievement of the Romans was to combine three basic elements, that is the arch as an architectural form together with concrete and brick. These three elements combined in various forms provided the foundation, as it were, for all Roman great building achievements. Today, we build the high-rise buildings, also for kind of spiritual reasons. The spiritual reason may be commercial purpose, money. It's a new religion. The primary function of architecture at origin is to provide shelter for people from the elements and that starts happening when people decide to settle in one place, whether it's permanently or if it's just for a season, for hunting or fishing, for example, or to uh, graze their flocks or whatever it is. An early, early man moved around a lot, was nomadic. And there must have been all sorts of temporary buildings. Igloos, for example, are still made today and those are evanescent structures, of course, because they will melt eventually. The ancient buildings were made from natural objects. Trees bent over to create some sort of shelter. There is something about man's innate makeup that makes him want to improve upon nature. That old idea of nature versus nurture. And so we see, first of all, the architecture imitating what were natural forms, tree trunks, bushes of flowers, etc. Aside from creating buildings that were purely functional, Bronze Age societies also had an interest in design. Look at some of the architecture they left behind. It's beautiful. We humans very much like to feel that we are in control of everything, which is why humans naturally tend to prefer symmetry as opposed to asymmetry in architecture and design. The ancients imitated shapes and forms found in nature, a footprint of civilization visible in modern design. If we look at any, of, any modern buildings, a lot of the forms inside buildings on the exterior of buildings still imitate tree forms, vegetative forms, and even if we have a stark building of glass and steel, within that building we have waterfalls added, we have plant forms, trees adding greenery to the shape of the interior foyers, etc. If you think, for example, the gherkin in London, it looks very much like um, a piña, it looks very much like a pine cone. I mean, that's a, one obvious example. The, the sheets of glass arranged on the exterior look very much like a classical pine cone. We start our journey with the majestic pyramids of ancient Egypt. These structures are still with us today and still inspire the same awe as they did when they were built. The pyramids were built horizontally by stacking bricks one atop the other. It would be a journey of many centuries before the vertical construction of Burj Khalifa, today the world's tallest building. It has always been the same while we built horizontally and vertically. Vertically we built something that is important. We built in centers. We built something where people go together for some reason, spiritual reason, business reason, 
horizontally we build for a living, for infrastructure. You may be confined to build vertically for practical purposes. That is, you need the space where you are confined by the space. The other idea, expanding on a practical level, could also be due to space. That is, you are not confined by space and therefore you are naturally going to expand. Standing 828 meters tall, Burj Khalifa has dominated the Dubai skyline since 2009. In fact, it is a competition around the world for the past 20 or so years regarding the skyscraper. That it's primarily humanity's desire for the expression, the visible demonstration of power. We then project that back onto, let's say, the ancient Egyptian pyramids, that, that was part of it as well. The pyramids of ancient Egypt were built as massive mausoleums for the pharaohs and queens, and were intended to last for all eternity. They had a picture of a very happy afterlife and living a, an Egyptian form of paradise and a sort of a field of reeds and a place of plenty. But the Egyptians didn't just build permanent structures for death. They built them, they also built temples. And these are gargantuan affairs as well. And the two have to be thought of together because the, the temples are houses for gods and the gods are eternal. And tombs are houses for the afterlife and the afterlife lasts an eternity. The most famous pyramid of all, the so-called Great Pyramid of Giza, was built around 2500 BC and is largely still intact. Also called the Khufu Pyramid, after the Pharaoh Khufu, it is the largest of the three mausoleums at the Giza Pyramid Complex. Now when we say large, it's about the same height as a 50-story building. Predating high-rise buildings by thousands of years, it's amazing to think that for over 3,500 years, it was the tallest man-made structure on Earth until Lincoln Cathedral in medieval Britain. The ancient Egyptians were truly reaching for the sky. Rather than thinking of them representing man's ambition to touch the sky, it could also be the endeavor of man to bring the celestial world down onto the terrestrial. And if we think about the shape of the periodical buildings, in many ways they look like the rays of the sun scattering upon the earth. So it could be that it's not man just merely aspiring to the heavens, but the heavens being brought down by man onto earth, the celestial meeting the terrestrial. The outer casing of the Great Pyramid was originally composed of two million square feet of white limestone. Just imagine how the Great Pyramid must have looked 4,500 years ago, gleaming white in the sun. Before, in ancient times, people were impressed by the spirituality of the building. Today, the people admire engineering practice, engineering inventions, and they feel impressed of new structures not because these structures present some spiritual meaning to them, but for engineering techniques. How can engineers build today such high structures? Will it fall down or not? Ambitious modern buildings require thousands of laborers, craftsmen, engineers and specialists of all kinds. Tombs dating back 4,000 years contain skeletons of pyramid building workers along with jars of beer and bread for their afterlife. They were valued workers. Common slaves would not have been buried with such ceremony or so near the pyramids. Within those structures, there's going to be a hierarchy of slaves in which the slaves themselves are going to be increasingly technically skilled. And we'll find that after the stones have been blocked, for example, then we're going to have more refined and skilled workers carving putting the decorations on, painting, moving the shape, moving the blocks of stones into position. All of this is going to require a whole hierarchy of slave labor from absolute brawn to technical skills, even below the architect. Of course, it wasn't an easy life by today's standards, more like hard labor. To raise the Great Pyramid, these laborers had to move into position six and a half million tons of stone with nothing but wood and rope.
so much for the workers, but did the Egyptians value their master builders? The planning involved in pyramid building required constructing not only the pyramids themselves, but also boat pits, worker housing, temples, and cemeteries. The appreciated architects or famous architects were always connected to the court, to the pharaoh, to the aristocracy, to the king. And these people were the only people able or capable to combine the art, design and technique. The first architect for whom we have a name is Imhotep. And Imhotep built not the Great Pyramid at Giza, but built the first uh, masonry pyramid, or first pyramid form, the Step Pyramid of Zosa at Saqqara in the 2600s BC. The Great Pyramid was built by Hemenu, who was responsible for all royal commissions. Perhaps Hemenu was one of the first superstar architects, or starchitects, a line of master builders that stretches to the present day greats like Frank Geary, Zaha Hadid, and Renzo Piano. These people were looked as a futurist. They were able to do something that other people couldn't do. The artists couldn't build structures. The engineers couldn't pay attention to the art. But architects is some, someone who combines the two. These people aren't just designers, they're not just good designers, they're not just inspired designers, but they're really stars. And there's only, only a, a few of them. But what is this area like today? These are the remains of Amarna, an Egyptian city built more than a thousand years after the pyramids at Giza. The city's remains tell us something about early urban planning. The city was located on the east bank of the Nile, and we can see from its ruins that it was laid out north to south along a royal route. The royal residences are to the north, and in the center were apparently the administrative and religious areas. The south of the city and its outskirts were made up of residential suburbs. The planned city of Amarna was built in less than 20 years. It was a forerunner of today's towns like Milton Keynes, Brasilia, Canberra, and New Belgrade. Many cities were built naturally from a small course of towns with small church or in ancient times similar sacrificed building and the buildings surrounded the church and the city grew and it's, it's natural and logical procedure. But if you push very ambitious projects, you have money to do this, but something is missing behind the good reason, the natural reason or evolution or good purpose. These ambition projects end by total disappointment or abandon. The sheer ambition of the pharaohs, though occasionally misplaced, left for us these great works. Some footprints of civilization get left in the dust by vital new cultures rising up to challenge their primacy. Emerging around 800 BC, Ancient Greece was the source of ideas about democracy, justice, art, and beauty, which are still influential today. But even they looked to the past for inspiration. Minoan art and architecture, obviously the precursor for Greek art and architecture. Uh, in some cases, very similar. Some scholars have suggested that really there isn't much of a difference between Minoan art and Greek art, or at least early. Greek art. 
The Minoans were the forerunners of modern Greeks, the ancient Greeks of the ancient Greeks. This is the Palace of Gnosis, the remains of a Minoan city only found and restored in the 20th century, Gnosis hints of a sophisticated civilization. Astonishingly, they built aqueducts and, yes, had even figured out indoor plumbing. These are things we take for granted, but were unknown to Bronze Age man until the Minoans. They introduced, for example, in Palace and Knossos and create system of sewage and uh, the fresh water was brought in into the houses. The Minoan civilization had indoor plumbing, including flush toilets, and that was continued throughout the ancient world, even up through ancient Rome. With the collapse of the Roman Empire, such capacity for what we would call plumbing, water management, uh, was lost and it would not resurface again until the 16th century, the fifth, late 1500s. Our early European ancestors seemed to have figured out the good life. Yet their advances didn't save the Minoans from a volcanic eruption on the Santorini Islands and the subsequent tsunami that decimated their largely coastal populations. So much was lost with the fall of the Minoans. But the Greeks were already picking up where the Minoans left off. If we think about archaic to classical Greece, there are three types of monumental building, basically. We have the great palaces of the kings, Mycenae. We have temple structures and we have tombs, monumental tombs. The tomb of Malsonus at Halicarnassus being the most famous and obvious example. These three buildings are all monuments to power of some sort. The power of the gods, the power of the gods on earth in the shape of the king, and the power of the king to continue in the afterlife. So we have a sort of continuum through those three types of building. I think that the main Greek innovation in architecture, design or building is open space. And this open space was allowed only by another invention, its column. Huge and high-rise column that can bear new type of roof. They allowed to builders to construct uh, bigger spans, bigger halls, where people can meet, can use these spaces in different way than before. No matter where you are in the world, chances are you've come across examples of architecture inspired by ancient Greece. The Oslo Trading Building, Norway. The Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. Buckingham Palace, and even the Auckland War Museum in New Zealand. These are all examples of neoclassical buildings. Neoclassical architecture was also known as Greek Revival. It was particularly popular in the 18th and 19th centuries, but there are plenty of modern homes built in Greek Revival style. The Greek architectural influence continued through history especially when Washington DC was being planned, in fact, um, uh, there was a, a conscious selection of architectural models, especially from what was the world's oldest democracy, to suit uh, the capital of what was one of the world's newest democracies. So there's conscious imitation there. These buildings were intended to make a statement about power, whether spiritual or political in nature. They are majestic buildings, even at first glance. 
if you want to impress people, if you want to make a statement or something, you must go higher. You go to the upper levels. If you enter the bank today, if the lobby of the bank is small, you don't respect the bank. The lobby must be a high-rise ceiling. If you go into the government building, uh, there must be high columns, uh, wide lobby. You respect such a environment. And in ancient times it was the same, so we can see the footprints from ancient times till today. People obviously thought of things in terms of prestige, and uh, a building project like the Parthenon in Athens is a prestige building. But before it's even that, and before it even represents the city, and before it even becomes a symbol of Greece as we are now told it is, it was a house for the goddess uh, Athena who was the patron goddess of Athens, from whom the city takes its name and therefore that democracy as well. The columns are so high that people felt very small, they respected the building. If you go to other times, you can see many copies of Pantheon, but these buildings are modern buildings. The White House was built 230 years ago as a symbol of a newly formed nation that valued some of the long lost classical Greek ideals. The mere fact that it's built on Capitol Hill is in itself proof that we have a continuum from ancient Rome through to the new states of America. There's also a nice story that there was a debate right at the beginning of the foundation of the United States about what would be the language, whether they would continue with English or ancient Greek. And in actual fact, there was a very narrow vote, if I remember correctly, that English only won out by a couple of votes. And it could have been that the new states were actually going to be speaking the new democratic language of ancient Greece. Back to specific architectural features. The Greeks didn't exactly invent the column, but they certainly perfected it. And with the discovery of marble as a building material, which they embraced, Greek architecture took a giant leap forward. You could think of building a building that might last an eternity. Um, you know, brick crumbles, rot, uh, wood rots, um, but marble just seems to, to stay there. And the, the densest and the hardest marbles that take the greatest polish seem to endure all the more. We are trying always to use the material that we that is around us. Sandstone, for example, in pyramids, uh, today we use a steel. Marble allowed the Greeks to design and build in ways thought previously impossible. Marble was building material at the times, but engineers or architects of that time, they invented that it can withstand much higher load that they could imagine. So they started to build high columns and the marble has so big loading capacity that they tried to dare a little bit more. They built thinner columns. What the column did, particularly for the ancient Greek, for ancient Greek architecture, there were already monumental buildings elsewhere, and there were monumental buildings in archaic Greek. But the column allowed buildings to be airy. It allowed colonnades, for example, places where people could walk, take shade, and escape the dreadful heat of the midday sun. So the columns not were only useful for support of the building, but they also supplied an aesthetic in that they allowed an airiness to a building that had previously not existed. Closer to home, isn't it astounding to think that the Greeks even pioneered an early form of central heating? They spread the heat from a fire through pipes hidden under the floors, which then heated their houses. Naturally, the fire would require constant maintenance. The classical world had a long run. To paraphrase Edgar Allan Poe, after the glory that was Greece, there was the grandeur that was Rome.
definitely a big footprint that the Romans left. The Romans invented uh, new structures, new type building typologies. The Romans as rulers of the known world had an ambiguous relationship with nature. They thought nature was there to be tamed. The Romans always take something that other civilizations have done and elaborate upon it. They are not great innovators themselves, but they are great elaborators. They take an idea and run with it. The conventional wisdom has it that what the Greeks first invented, the Romans improved upon. Once the Romans expand throughout the Italian Peninsula, and certainly by the third and second centuries BC, they are now able to use the same materials that the ancient Greeks had already been using for centuries before, most especially marble. So they not only copied what they saw the ancient Greeks doing, but they wound up copying the methods and techniques that they used as well. A modern glass skyscraper gleaming in the sun owes more of a debt to ancient Rome than you might think. The glass is building material of today where we can see it on the facade, we can see it in windows, in doors, everywhere. It has the same structure or same function like it has 2,000 years ago. Glass is certainly used by the Romans because there are glass window panes that have been found at Herculaneum. Now, it's a very kind of thick glass, it's slightly opaque. You can see through it, but it's a distorting image you see because it wasn't important for them to actually look through a window. What was important was that the window illuminated the interior. Glass windows in Roman times were first used mainly in the building of public baths, a neat solution to stopping a draft. Modern contemporary culture takes for granted the use of glass, particularly with architecture. It provides you visibility and provides you a degree of security. That's true in more and more in these very beautiful skyscrapers, but now innovation and architecture using the glass from the outside to reflect what is also around it. By the first century AD, homes were being fitted with thick glass windows. In addition, the Romans were also the first to mix and create concrete. The Stadium of Domitian and the Colosseum are two great examples of their use of concrete. In any event, we're talking about the very late first century, so the 80s in the first century. And that was probably those two structures, certainly in the city of Rome, could mark the beginning of what would then become a centuries-long construction campaign relying more and more on concrete structurally and less and less on stone. Purely technically speaking, concrete is the assembly of lime, stone and water. The lime comes through the chemical reaction with water and binds the stones together. In such a substance that has some time to mature, the capacity or loading capacity of such a material is very high. Also, Roman concrete was made with pozzolana, which was the main ingredient in the mortar, which is a sort of volcanic sand, which came from pozzuoli or puteoli in Latin in southern uh, Italy, and that um, had that was incredibly strong. It had hydraulic properties, so it would set under water, for example. It wouldn't disperse in water, it would set. Now you can imagine that's very important if you're trying to build a bridge, or if you're building a harbour, or something like that. Many practical applications to it. And then when it set, it, it really went rock hard. They called their concrete pozzolana. It was both versatile and durable. Even better, they could produce an unlimited supply. That was certainly not the case for the Greeks and their marble.
The Romans still had an appreciation for the beauty of marble, but they used it as a final layer or veneer. Within, there was usually concrete doing the heavy lifting. The Forum in Rome, the Colosseum, and the Pantheon are all visited daily by thousands of tourists. All those structures owe their long lives to concrete. Think of the Pantheon, a huge, huge building, and that dome doesn't have a single reinforcing bar in it, and it's still there. And in that particular case, the Romans were even more clever because as you go up through the building, the aggregate, so what you throw into the mortar to give it body and make the whole thing cohere, was changed, it was graded, so at the bottom it had pieces of marble, so very dense hard stone, and by the time you got to the top of the dome, so where it's curving over, you would have just tough tufa. So that made the actual weight of the structure itself lighten um, as it rose to the top. Modern-day sporting stadiums like the Beijing National Stadium in China greatly impress with their size and sheer crowd capacity. It too owes a debt to the ancient Roman amphitheaters, the first massive sporting and entertainment stadiums. The footprints of civilization can also be found on the playing fields. We can see, of course, similarities. Colosseum was a place where people met for even performance or fighting or whatever. Today we have exactly similar places. They don't look like Colosseum, but still they, they gather many people and these structures are fantastic. These are big stadiums or big event halls. The Colosseum is predicated upon the arch. Without the discovery of the arch and the combination of the arch and concrete and brick, it could have been constructed certainly to the height in which it stands today. There's entrances to the entire perimeter of the Colosseum, and each of those is numbered as well. So this meant it was an extremely efficient way of getting 100,000 people into the building without um, them being trampled and being able to do it in a short period of time. So the staircase system in the Colosseum and the ramp system to feed people into it, and all the various different levels of the building as well, um, that bears easy comparison with a modern arena. What a sight that must have been. As with today's big budget entertainment spectaculars, from superhero movies to rock concerts, the Romans threw everything they had at these extravaganzas. Not even the biggest title fight in Las Vegas can compare with the Roman games. Unlike today's entertainment, the stakes were high for the participants. Not just box office returns, but life or death. And if some people complain about today's entertainment being too violent, they should just reflect on the Romans and their bloodthirsty games. Sometimes the footprints of civilization don't seem so civilized. The technique that we admire at Colosseum, that one week there was a fighting match, uh, then they flooded with water, there was a, another performance, etc. It changed quite quickly and they could do it within one day. It used to be said that the flooding of the Colosseum was a myth invented by the poets, Marshall in particular, who says that in the inaugural games, the land magically appeared from the sea in the morning. Recent archaeological work has shown that the poet was probably correct. It seems that the drainage system that was used for draining Nero's lake was later reused for draining the Colosseum. Now that doesn't really explain how the Colosseum itself was flooded, but it has been and suggested that around the arena area there are about 40 channels, drains, that would fill the Colosseum with rainwater. So we only have to imagine tanks outside the Colosseum which could be released to flood the Colosseum and then the old drainage system opened to let the water out again.
What are we doing today in event halls is the same. Monday we have an ice hockey match, Wednesday we have a concert of Popstar, and Friday we have motorcycle races. But the Romans left us with more than just a passion for violent spectacle. The invention of the Ark was also revolutionary as the calm in Greek times, because with the Ark or statics of the Ark you can do bigger spans than with the combs. Arches are made up of blocks that are called voussoirs. They're wedge-shaped blocks that fit together and they make an arc. Uh, and this is what gives the, uh, the arch its stability, is this compression. The keystone at the top is the last of these wedge-shaped stones that's inserted. And once that's inserted, the arch is completely stable. The Egyptians and Greeks had used arches, mostly underground, in vaults and sewers. The Romans took the arch to new heights. This is the Mike O'Callaghan Pat Tillman Memorial Bridge. It spans the Colorado River between Nevada and Arizona, part of the Hoover Dam Bypass Project. What it owes to ancient Roman ingenuity is not difficult to see. It's the widest concrete arch bridge in the Western Hemisphere, and it's the arch design of this bridge which enabled builders and planners to overcome hundreds of meters of steep cliffs. The bridges that were built 2,000 years ago and we are still using today is not really because of invention of concrete or other materials. It's because uh, the architects of that time they had no such a precise means to calculate the structures. They just put a lot of materials according to their experience to withstand the loads. So the bridges of Roman times were over-calculated and that's why we can use them still today. The Pont du Gard aqueduct in the south of France is another good example. Arches were an essential component of Roman aqueducts and bridges. They were not built from concrete, but from limestone. The spectacular Pont du Gard was still in use until just a few decades ago. Other civilizations had brought water distances to supply cities, but the Romans elaborate upon this and bring water from distances that previously had not been imagined. The largest aqueduct feeding the city of Rome was completed in the middle of the first century under Emperor Nero. The population of the city of Rome was about a quarter of a million inhabitants. Only 70 years later, by the time Emperor Hadrian, the population of the city of Rome exploded to roughly three million inhabitants. In 70 years, one reason, the aqueducts Suddenly, every Roman, the poorest of the poor, the wealthiest of the wealthy, had 24-7 access to clean, fresh, potable, sanitary, drinking, free water. Water was fed to various urban outlets. In houses, it would only be the houses of the very rich, obviously, but also to public fountains. And some of these fountains were built on a colossal scale. But if you want to get some idea of the kind of excitement of that, the, the, the arrival of water from another world, you know, from the mountain, you can't do better than go and see the Fontane di Trevi, which is very much in the spirit of the Roman aqueduct, and is fed by a Roman aqueduct. That original fountain was supplied with water pumped from an aqueduct, which also supplied water to the Roman baths. The public baths were a great Roman invention. The idea that one should bathe communally in groups, either mixed or segregated, was something that the Romans took to the nth degree. We think of the great baths of Caracalla, for example, which are like huge sports social complexes as well as bathing complexes. You could joke that the Romans really put the art into architecture. 
the footprint of their genius for building can still be seen today. The arch today is really more of an ornamental feature on buildings. And that's because building technologies have changed. Whether stacking bricks together in a single building or creating whole blocks of buildings, Roman urban planning may be surprisingly familiar. Roman's main architectural achievement is in city design and city layout. We think of the grid system of modern cities like New York. That is totally predicated on a Roman military camp. When the Roman military machine move north, south, east, west, its encampments, be they small or large, form the basis eventually for most of the modern towns across Europe. Cologne, Vienna, Paris, London. The footprints of civilization in architecture can be seen everywhere. The Burj Khalifa in Dubai, the Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing, the Michael Callahan Pat Tillman Memorial Bridge in the U.S. Modern day architecture dazzles with its height, its scale, and the shapes and forms never seen before in building. Architecture is the environment you live and prosper in. It makes you wonder how these modern day masterpieces will be viewed by people hundreds, even thousands of years in the future. Or indeed, if they will stand the test of time the way ancient architecture has. These buildings are testament to the ingenuity and willpower of the ancient world. There's always been that idea that man can improve upon the natural world. The Romans, unlike any other ancient civilization, was able to dominate the landscape. The ancients created the building block for the world around us, one we simply take for granted. So, wherever you look, so long as you know how to look, you'll see all around you the footprints of civilization. We live in an age of wonders, where technology moves faster than we can keep pace. Human and machine have begun to merge. Artificial intelligence is both slave and master, and space exploration seems set to catch up with the dreams of science fiction. It might seem hard to imagine what we have in common with our ancestors. We still owe so much to the ancient world, from ideas about democracy to written language, the way we build to the way we spend our leisure time. Profound scientific breakthroughs, inventions that change the world. If you know where to look, the footprints of civilization are all around. The scientific discoveries and technological breakthroughs of the ancient world have shaped our lives in so many ways. Knowledge is always helping people to understand and to take decisions, also to develop a technology based on science, which can improve the daily life. In this episode, we'll trace those footprints from prehistory to the present day from the invention of the wheel to new land speed records. From battlefield surgery on Roman gladiators to the technological strides made in a world war. One of the most obvious footprints of the ancient world is the use of the wheel. The passage from the hunters and gatherers to the farmers can be considered to be the most important revolution of uh, prehistorical times. First thing that is coming to my mind is the calendar. Of course, it's on every, on every mobile phone and we use it, and now it's sort of the whole world is using one calendar because of now the planet is so interconnected. Since the very dawn of mankind, even before recorded history, science and technological progress helped mold the world around us.
ancient Mesopotamia. This part of the world has often been referred to as the cradle of civilization. It's that part of the world where so many different interesting elements and techniques and innovations were actually introduced. Speaking of Mesopotamia, of course, uh, the uh, single most important uh, uh, innovation was uh, urban civilization. So the city was uh, basically born uh, there. And it was here that one of the most important technological developments since fire was thought to have originated. The wheel. It's believed the wheel was invented and developed in Mesopotamia around 3500 BC and has been with us ever since in many forms. The first wheels were potter's wheels, carved out of wood. Later, some bright sparks figured out how to use them for chariots, with four wheels and two axles. From the historical point of view, the wheel develops between 3,000 and 2,000 before common era in different locations. So you have different cultures, perhaps, that aren't using this, what then must have been incredibly new technology. They see it, it's very simple in its design, and so it pretty much spreads rather rapidly throughout the ancient world. Famously, the ancient Egyptians, the, their use of the chariot in battle, having archers moving at very rapid speeds in these chariots mounted, again, on wheels. Buckle up and hold on to your hats. This is the Hennessy Venom GT. Even its name sounds powerful. It holds the current land speed record, accelerating from zero to nearly 300 kilometers per hour in under 15 seconds. It can cruise along at 435 kilometers per hour. The Venom GT has other high performance cars like the Bugatti Chiron nipping at its wheels. Of course, cars like these are powered by an internal combustion engine. But that engine would go nowhere fast were it not for that one particular early invention. This is the atomic clock. It's capable of measuring time within a quadrillionth of a second, powered by strontium atoms, Experts are confident this timekeeper will neither lose nor gain a second for the lifetime of the universe. Time is a, really a footprint of civilization. Time was uh, uh, basically discovered or created as a concept uh, by the uh, Babylonians, by the Sumerians. Of course, what ancient civilization had was looking at the sky, looking at what was happening in nature around them. And they could see that there was a season cycle, for example, that the sun was going in a latitude which was not the equator up and down during the year at different elevations with respect to the horizon, this kind of observations. And the key word out of this was periodicity. The Babylonians were perhaps the first people to accurately measure time. They divided the year into 12 months with 30 days in each, divided hours into 60 minutes, and then minutes into 60 seconds. Both the Mesopotamian civilizations and also the Egyptians introduced the sundial, uh, or the obelisk in the case of the Egyptians, in order to measure uh, the passing of time, uh, the movement of uh, light, uh, which would indicate uh, the shift from uh, one period of time to the following. Okay, the Babylonians' degree of accuracy was not quite a quadrillionth of a second, but given their Bronze Age technology, it was still pretty remarkable. It's a system that has served us well for centuries. Then from those uh, Mesopotamian civilizations, uh, these concepts passed on to uh, the Greeks and then from the Greeks to the Romans and so on. The 
the ancient world, everyone knew that there were certain months, usually at least four months of the year, when you did not sail in the Mediterranean. You did not attempt to navigate the waters because they're very rough during the winter, and you therefore risk not only loss of life to yourself and your crew, but perhaps even more importantly, depending on your perspective, the product that you're trying to gain capital upon. Practically all later civilizations learned from the Babylonians to look to the skies for a deeper understanding of the world around them. They kept on looking at data and finding periodicities. And then what happens is on the basis of this data, then we, we have a model. For example, then we now know that the moon is going around the Earth, and then we can interpret this cycle in terms of the movement of the moon. The Babylonians were also the first mathematicians of note. Babylonian mathematics included a rudimentary understanding of fractions, algebra, quadratic and cubic equations, and even trigonometry. This is the Plimpton 322. It's a 3,700-year-old tablet which is stored at Columbia University. It suggests that the Babylonians were studying trigonometry, the lengths and angles of triangles, well before the ancient Greeks. It is probably the earliest trigonometric table. So this actually would highlight uh, of the role of the Sumerians from the point of view of developing an approach, an interest towards higher level of mathematics. According to some math historians, the Babylonians may have even calculated the Pythagorean theorem a thousand years before Pythagoras. The square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Who can forget that from high school? It's a formula that is still in use every day. Most people, when they think of geometry, they cannot but think of the Greeks, Pythagoras, Euclid, etc. The interests on the part of the ancients, and specifically the ancient Greeks, it begins with very practical intentions, reasons, purposes. If you want to design something which an engineer can actually build and make stable, you need geometry. Sadly, we are no longer able to admire the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. They were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, a marvel of Babylonian building. But what is left of Babylon looks geometrically correct. We can also see from the Babylonian pyramids so-called ziggurats, that they understood that the triangle was the strongest form in geometry. It was also pretty much used for engineering purposes or reasons. Uh, if you need to build structures such as pyramids or the ziggurat in Mesopotamia, for example, so temples or other huge buildings, you probably need uh, to calculate precisely how these structures should be constructed. This computer graphic, a theoretical reconstruction of the Tower of Babylon, clearly illustrates the importance of geometry in building. The beginnings of geometry left an unmistakable footprint of civilization. Standing atop the ziggurats and looking up at the night sky was the beginning of another scientific discipline. 
nearly 5,000 years ago, Babylonian stargazers became the first astronomers. Of course, astronomers did use mathematics and they still do it. Especially, I would say, geometry and trigonometry was uh, much needed. Why? Because uh, astronomy has to deal with movements in the sky. So, you know, mathematics and physics are always somehow catching up each other. Sometimes mathematics is going farther than what physics is able to, to, to catch it up. And sometimes the opposite, the physicist discovers something that needs a mathematical modeling to be fully understood and modeled. The Hubble Space Telescope has greatly expanded our knowledge of the universe. Launched in orbit around the Earth in 1990, it's the most powerful telescope ever built. It's about the size of a school bus, but unlike any school bus, it can span the distance between London and Los Angeles in under 20 minutes. It's almost as much a time machine as it is a telescope. Why? Because a distant galaxy appears through its lens as it did when the light left it, which might be millions of years ago. And it's all a long way from the ancient Babylonians, standing on tiptoes atop their ziggurats. They had a similar purpose, to figure out our place in the universe. They did not really have the instruments that we can rely on today, of course, but they did have some uh, instruments, some uh, sort of technology that they could uh, employ for their observations. The armillary uh, sphere, for example, all those instruments were employed uh, not really to inquire into the nature of the celestial bodies, but rather to measure their movement. Now we have astronomy, but astronomy is fascinating, uh, and especially technology is, is able to fascinate people as much as the looking at the stars uh, in former times. Because what do we have? We discovered we have now uh, the space exploration. Uh, we have orbiting observatories around the Earth. They sent us incredible images of the universe, of what's happening in the universe, of the Milky Way, what are the surfaces of the planet. By around 2000 BC, or 4000 years ago, the Babylonians were recording lunar eclipses. By 700 BC, they could predict lunar eclipses based on their record keeping. Prediction is another characteristic of science. How you can predict, and for example, predicting that winter will come again, this on the basis of observations. Predicting an eclipse, this was a big issue in, in former times. At that time, science and religious belief were a little mixed up, so people were afraid if the moon was uh, suddenly becoming uh, dark or the sun was disappearing. Uh, there was a lot of fear, and so the governments had to know it before. In order for civilization to develop, a revolution had to take place that should never be taken for granted. Mankind shifted from being hunter-gatherers to farmers. The passage from the hunters and gatherers to the farmers happened roughly 10,000 years ago in the time of the Stone Age, occurring between the Paleolithic and the Neolithic. So this is the period of time in which you have this shift from those who uh, relied on uh, hunting and gathering what could find, basically, to those who decided to settle within a specific portion of land or territory, grow their uh, crops or domesticate their cattle or other animals. As sure as the sun rose in the morning and set in the evening, the ancient Egyptians needed food and water. Then, as now, most of Egypt was a desert. However, every year the Nile would flood, 
spilling over with water that flowed down from the mountains to the south. But when the water receded, it left behind rich soil in which the ancient Egyptians grew their crops. To irrigate their crops, the Egyptians created a canal system. They built gates to these canals so they could control the flow of water, and they built reservoirs to store water in case of drought. Whatever the drawbacks of early agriculture, the majority of ancient Egyptians could now feed themselves. Once a society is able to do that, it can flourish and develop in all sorts of unforeseen ways. Of course, uh, uh, the society of farmers uh, is much more uh, specialized uh, than the society uh, of the hunters and gatherers. So there is a specialization, a specialization of the different roles that they have within this uh, society. Also settlement is one of the advantage of this. Uh, while you settle, you can live a kind of stable life. You can have control of a, a specific uh, portion of territory. The ancient Egyptians were also obsessed with the night sky. They could identify five of the planets in our solar system. They also observed that the rising of Sirius, the dog star with the sun, would precede the annual flooding of the River Nile. Some Egyptologists even believe the Sphinx, the Giza Pyramid Complex, and the River Nile were a mirror image of the constellations of Leo Orion's Belt, and the Milky Way. There are many reasons for doing this. Religious as an observatory, because then you, you use the buildings as an observatory for measuring, for example, time and, and the transit of stars, uh, or uh, just because it's beautiful. Research suggests the Egyptians were able to align structures to true north within one-tenth of a degree, as is the case with Khufu's pyramid. But how were the Egyptians able to line up the pyramids at Giza with the three stars on Orion's belt? We may never know. It's nice to think that every, I don't know how many years, a given star, for example, Aldebaran, is peering through the hole directly to the grave of a great king. It has a power for the imagination. There's nothing, it's just geometry. But if you want to see the beauty out of it and the power of building up the whole celestial mechanics that is doing this, to govern celestial mechanics so certain things are happening, uh, this is the beauty out of it. It's arguably another ancient Egyptian footprint of civilization that we still align buildings with the sun, although this is for practical reasons such as heat and light rather than religious belief. But Egyptian contributions to science and technology originate in some mysterious ways. Strange as it may seem, it was the Egyptian process of mummification that led to some early breakthroughs in medical science. Mummification involved the removal of organs and stuffing the dried body with rags, plants, and spices so it would keep its shape. As they went about their grisly trade, these early Egyptian taxidermists learned much about the workings of the human body. The first heart transplants were performed around 50 years ago, a mere blink of an eye in terms of world history. It was quite a journey from removing organs to being able to perform organ transplants. But that journey began in ancient Egypt and with mummification. Thanks to mummification, Egyptians came to understand much about the human body. They practiced basic surgery, could fix broken bones and dislocated joints, and even stitch wounds effectively. Newfound knowledge mixed with deeply held beliefs. 
the Egyptians believed they were preparing the corpse of the king for eternal life. Medicine was mixed with alchemy and the quest for immortality. As, as a technique, it belongs to a vast species, though, of material transformations, which are not medieval in origin or, or, or Egyptian, um, but being practiced throughout the Middle East uh, in the Bronze Age and earlier. And what, what's happening is attempts to, to transform materials, uh, to, to alter their properties, um, or to make uh, syntheses of things that exist in nature. If we consider Egypt, they uh, did know how to uh, deal with uh, minerals. Uh, from this point of view, we can find some kind of connections between the alchemical aim of finding, of transforming uh, into a higher standard and uh, the way in which they actually use these uh, minerals. For example, pottery. Even the idea of taking clay from the ground, this wet and malleable substance, and then firing it in a kiln begins to give clay the properties of stone because it's harder. Admittedly, it's brittle, but it's harder. When you then have the invention of glazes that are given to, to pottery, then this is not only like a stone, but it's like a stone that can take a very high polish. Now, no alchemist ever found a way to prolong life or transform lead into gold, but their experiments led them to some interesting conclusions. What sustained it in classical antiquity and right into the early modern period was also the Aristotelian world system where everything was composed basically of four elements, earth, air, fire, water. It was believed that basically anything could be transformed with the right processes from one state to another. But there was this idea of an essentially um, infinite uh, intercommutability between elements. And of course, all these ideas were lost in modernity with the advent of the periodic table um, towards the end of the 19th century and a completely different elemental view of the world. Perhaps it's because we are the only earthly species aware of our own mortality, but eternal life, or at least a greatly prolonged existence, is something humans still dream of. Some scientists believe that the first human to reach 1,000 years of age has already been born, all thanks to the thousands of years of alchemical, chemical, and medicinal findings. Ancient Egypt was the birthplace of the medical profession. In those days, people would come from faraway lands to be treated by Egyptian physicians. But across the Mediterranean, another civilization was getting ready to take the baton of progress. When we think of uh, Greek philosophy, we tend to think of these uh, philosophers, maybe in their gardens, working and thinking about uh, pretty much theoretical uh, things. But we need to know that philosophy uh, also means science. Uh, so also means uh, uh, something concrete. For example, knowing that the Earth is round and is not flat, uh, discovering what is the size of the orbits of the planets, that is the size of the solar system, the size of the sun. The big um, discoveries from the point of view of, of physics are those, are changes of perspective, op opening minds to a new way of looking at the world and, and all the consequences. Broken down into two Greek words, and intimate love of something. Philia, of what? Sophia, wisdom, an overarching ultimate wisdom. The Greeks also continued the good work of medical science. One should not forget that many people at that time believed diseases were the God's way of punishing sinful humans. But those ideas began to change in ancient Greece, mostly due to the work of one man a man whose name we still remember. It was around 450 BC when a certain Hippocrates of Kos began conducting experiments to prove the symptoms of disease were caused by the body's natural reaction to diet, environmental factors, and so on. 
certainly not by vengeful gods. Hippocrates has been called the father of Western medicine. The Hippocratic Oath, which bears his name, was the first known attempt to set an ethical standard among medical practitioners. The Oath of Hippocrates is the single most important document in the history of medicine, establishing the medical tradition in the West. So establishing medicine as a sort of tradition, as a scientific and ethical tradition uh, in Western culture. Hippocrates lived to be 90, a very old age for that time, and his words certainly live on. I will use treatment to help the sick according to my ability and judgment, but never with a view to injury and wrongdoing. Neither will I administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course. the 1960s, uh, uh, this was still something uh, pretty much uh, uh, used uh, in Western universities, for example in the big British universities such as Oxford and Cambridge. What is sometimes called the golden rule doesn't change, but our understanding of the world does. What is the universe made of? How did it begin? Physicists today are still seeking answers using particle accelerators, such as the Large Hadron Collider, well-named because it's the largest machine in the world. A 20-mile-plus ring-shaped tunnel made mainly of superconducting magnets some 100 meters underground. Scientists hope this particle accelerator will answer the big questions. Yet around 2,400 years ago in ancient Greece, one man working on his own and without even a small hadron collider came up with some remarkable insights. This one had the promising name of Democritus, who declared that all matter was comprised of atoms and his footprint is hard to overlook. These atoms were, he said, physically but not geometrically indivisible. He also believed that between atoms there lay empty space. Furthermore, atoms are indestructible and perpetually in motion. But there were many such eureka moments in ancient Greece, including another one we all learned about in school, when a philosopher named Archimedes stepping into his bath, cried, Eureka! Eureka! Or, I found it! I found it! In his tub, Archimedes had, in a flash, understood that the volume of water he had displaced getting in the bath must be equal to the volume of the part of his body he had submerged. In essence, the law of hydrostatics. Archimedes and what he had uh, and all the studies about the leverage and the way in which you can actually compute the force that is keeping a ship up. I always thought as a kid, how can an iron ship survive? It still be, uh, is why it's not droning. Now we take it for granted, but it, it's sort of study also this one coming out of science. It's an application of science and of scientific thinking. Archimedes wrote admiringly of Aristarchus, a Greek astronomer who had lived before him. Aristarchus of Samos uh, is claimed to be the first one of the first to advance the uh, idea that the Earth and uh, the other planets uh, were actually rotating around uh, the Sun. So we know how this idea then was abandoned uh, after a few, uh, a few centuries. The heliocentric system uh, was controversial, became controversial uh, in the 16th and 17th century of Copernicus and Galileo for several reasons. One was that it wasn't included in the model of the universe that had been handed down um, since Plato, actually, even slightly earlier, with the Earth at its centre, which had been then canonised, it had been sort of enshrined um, in the Aristotelian 
view of the universe, which was the common belief of uh, how the universe functioned, with the Earth at its centre and the Sun uh, moving round it like the other heavenly bodies. So it was difficult to shake off that tradition. So much for the universe, but what about coming back down to Earth and finding ourselves? The Global Positioning System, or GPS, is a mainstay for motor vehicles and modern smartphones. And where would the motorist or traveler of today be without these navigation systems? Completely and utterly lost, probably. It's important to think that each subsequent civilization is standing on the shoulders, as they say, of a previous civilization. So that's certainly true of the ancient Greeks regarding navigation in terms of going distances beyond the ancient Greek world. So basically the Eastern Mediterranean venturing into Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, or even beyond um, into Persia, perhaps beginning with maybe Alexander the Great, fourth century BC, and his interaction with the famous astronomers slash astrologers from Mesopotamia, the ancient Near and Middle East. You're looking at an early global navigation system. It is, of course, a map. At over 2,200 years old, it's one of the first known maps of the world, or more accurately, the known world, according to the Greeks. It was the work of one Eratosthenes, a cultured man who ran the Library of Alexandria. One of his most impressive feats was to calculate the circumference of the Earth. Then it turned out something like 40,000 kilometers, which is extremely close to what actually is the measured uh, circumference of the Earth. So he uh, went pretty close to the truth uh, just by uh, considering the movement of shadows, the movement of light and of the sun uh, around the earth. So basically by employing the uh, sundial. He knew that uh, at a certain date of the year that the sun was going, the sun rays were going straight to the bottom of a, of a well. And he knew that in another place, at the same time, this was not happening. So one of the possibility was that the Earth was not actually flat, it was round. This was explaining this difference. Let's then get this funny idea of, uh, that the world is round, is not flat. Can we measure how, how big it is? And this is the next major step of science, measuring the universe, cosmology. The natural philosophers of ancient Greece were so far ahead of their time, it's hard to believe. If the Greeks were philosophers, the Romans were eminently practical people. More than the Greeks, certainly the Romans did this. And once you've mapped the territory, you know where point X is in relation to point Z. The Romans famously are going to build a road so that they have a connection to that point, which then frees them from having to constantly rely on navigating by virtue of the heavens or even by virtue of maps. Telling the truth, they were not always uh, innovators, but they were really clever in uh, discovering, re-employing, reusing the other's discoveries. So they managed to use uh, the techniques uh, invented or discovered by the Greeks, and they bent these uh, techniques for their practical, military, and social, political purposes. With a quite justifiable reputation as the fastest highway in the world, the German Autobahn is a motorway designed just for cars. Anything that can't go faster than 80 kilometers per hour is not permitted on the Autobahn, which pretty much rules out bicycles and pedestrians. There's no upper speed limit on much of the motorway, and it is illegal to stop unnecessarily. That includes running out of fuel.
Of course, the only fuel on the roads in ancient times was stamina. But with horses and carts the only traffic, why did the Romans build such sturdy roads? Well, Rome did not become an empire without being able to mobilize its armies. Communication due primarily to Roman roads, the system of Roman roads that the ancient Romans built all throughout their former empire. Uh, that was the primary vehicle for allowing other vehicles of travelers, uh, oftentimes runners, couriers, if you will. That's where the famous Pony Express probably, probably began. In the third century BC, the Via Appia, a famous Roman road, was constructed, connecting the capital with the port town of Brindisi. Now it's a free tourist attraction, although the first nearly five kilometers of the Via Appia, or Appian Way, are still traversed every day by cars, buses, and coaches. Not only that, but parts of Britain's A1 motorway are based on the old Roman routes. So when it comes to transport, in a very real sense, all roads do lead to Rome. They well and truly left the footprints of their civilization. And with their aqueducts, drains and baths, it's clear that Romans understood the importance of sanitation, placing them way ahead of some later civilizations. So the Romans would inherit from the Greeks uh, this attention to or for the body. Water was very important for the uh, Romans. We know they uh, constructed so many different aqueducts. Well, the, uh, the Roman aqueduct is certainly probably one of their stereotypically most famous achievements science and technology wise. They were among the first, the earliest civilization to connect the hygienical purposes, hygiene and social status and social environment and background. So it came to be understood, bathing wasn't just a luxury, but a necessity. All of the aqueducts feeding, for example, the city of Rome, begin 60 miles outside the city and the central part of the peninsula in the Apennine Mountains, inside the mountains from natural springs of water. And the problem becomes for the Roman engineer is what happens when suddenly my tunnel comes out the side of a mountain cliff and I'm facing a rather large valley in front of me before I get to the next mountain. And so to maintain that certain gradation for the flow of water, the ancient Romans built what we think of as these aqueducts in order to cover these vast expanses of land until we at least get to the next mountain where we go back inside or ultimately until we get into the city. The Romans themselves discovered and understood that every certain number of feet within the length of an aqueduct, right, your gradation had to drop by a very precise amount. How exactly the ancient Romans were able to figure that out remains still somewhat of a mystery. The ruins of the Baths of Catacalla outside Rome. In their heyday, with high vaulted ceilings, separate hot and cold baths, they must have been magnificent. The aqueduct which served the Baths of Catacalla was in use until the 19th century. The Romans also advanced the practice of medicine by publishing treatises that could be read, well, by anyone who could read. Ordinary citizens also had greater access to professional doctors. Medicines were manufactured, including pills using plants and herbs. Next time you take a pill for a headache, heartburn, or anything really, remember the Romans. The Romans also developed specialized instruments for surgery, ranging from forceps to wound retractors. 
specific kinds of surgery techniques and instruments, uh, especially those uh, dealing with fractures and similar, were also due to their uh, activism within the military field. This is also the reason uh, why they managed to develop uh, these uh, specific substances uh, like morphine or uh, what we would call nowadays uh, scopolamine that could actually quench the pain of uh, the sick so they could uh, basically uh, translate. Even their interest in war seemed to have survived until modern times, and with it, giant leaps in technological progress. Consider technological advances made during World War II, the first jet planes, radar and atomic power, the Enigma machine, a German code device that anticipated computer technology, the German V-2 rockets that were the first man-made objects to ever travel into space. So from the point of view of war, of course the Romans uh, developed or reused many instruments, especially as far as uh, siege warfare uh, is concerned. So they invented or uh, just employed oldest uh, instruments that were already employed by other civilizations, by the Greeks, uh, for example, the, the ballista, uh, the catapult, uh, the siege tower. So all those instruments whose function uh, was that of uh, rendering or making the life of Roman soldiers uh, a little easier. But it also somehow would be the precursor of what we have really in contemporary civilization, another ancient footprint, creating a greater and greater distance between two enemy forces. It almost numbs one to the impact that such bloodshed, devastation, death, maiming has on the human psyche. So much so to this day that now we have drones and someone sitting thousands of miles away from the target can rather disinterestedly neutralize, as we like to say, that target. What we really mean is kill, destroy. In war and peacetime, the technological and engineering feats of the Romans just kept coming. But even the glory of this civilization couldn't save it from a fall, a fall that meant a giant leap backwards for science and technology. So what happened to all that ancient ingenuity and know-how? For centuries after the fall of Rome, Western Europe was plunged into the Dark Ages. Agriculture returned to the subsistence farming of the Neolithic era. Literacy receded and was even scorned. Medicine was substituted with blind faith and superstition. But in the Middle East, there was a glimmer of hope in libraries and places of learning, such as the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. The wisdom of the ancient world was preserved. Footprints of civilizations are interesting and relevant and important uh, because they say something specific. They say what, as humans, we all share, we have in common, and at the same time, they highlight what, as individuals, we develop uh, in a specific way. With the 14th century, came the Renaissance and a great surge of interest in classical teaching in Europe. Somehow, by the skin of our teeth, humanity had scraped by. Tracing the footprints of civilization saved us once, and if we know how to learn from our mistakes, may even help us yet. There are many famous sayings about history and about its value. Uh, one of the several that I like is to remember not only to learn from errors of the past, to improve positive progress for humanity, but to remember also that we're always standing on the shoulders of giants who have come before us. Scientists, philosophers, innovators, those who are immersed and imbued with the process of critical thinking. The Footprints of Civilization. When we look back on our past, we can see them everywhere. 
When we say our past, that implies a past which we can all share. The legacy of the civilizations that prospered around the Mediterranean, such as ancient Egypt, Babylon, Greece, and Rome. You don't have to be a genealogical descendant of any of those cultures to live in their long shadow. Their traces are all around. So-called ancient history spans a period of around three and a half thousand years, from the beginning of written language in around 3100 BCE until the fall of Rome in the fifth century CE. We can find a lot of ourselves by examining those worlds and those societies. From ancient society, we have taken many good things. We have taken democracy. We have taken law. So far, we have never encountered any civilization which didn't have trace of religion. So religion is one of the most common elements that we find in basically all the civilizations. In ancient Egypt, there was a plurality of deities, divinities polytheism. The ancient Greeks, the inventors of Western philosophy, the inventors of democracy. One of the famous questions that many Greek philosophers posed, what does it mean to live a good life? What is a good life? What is being happy? What is leisure? All these things. Some might suggest that we today are perhaps more similar to the ancient Roman, measuring quantitatively the quality of life, which is ironic. And that primarily had to do with land ownership and what you can do with land, namely growing crops and grazing animals. Though that all seems a long time ago, this series aims to bring that world a little closer. When we look at these ancient societies, we actually find a, quite a number of uh, places, cities that were extremely multicultural. Alexandria at its peak was an extremely multicultural and extremely tolerant uh, city with a multiple of ethnicities, religious traditions, very vibrant culture. In a sense, Alexandria would remain dead up to, we could claim, modern days. One of the building blocks of any society is religion. Consider the massive gatherings that take place in its name, such as the crowds of up to 300,000 people that assemble in St. Peter's Square in the name of Christianity. Faith has continued to evolve over the centuries. Today, the dominant world religions seem to share the concept often called the Golden Rule. Though that might not seem to have much in common with ancient beliefs, at their core, all religions have something in common. What does this word religion mean? Two words, to bind together again. To bind what together again? Members of society. We can all think of examples where faith has divided nations and peoples. There are dark chapters, such as the Crusades or the Spanish Inquisition. For early man, alone in the dark, with every day a battle for survival, the belief in a maker and an afterlife must have provided some comfort and meaning to an existence that was cruel, brutish, and often short. Primitive societies were essentially polytheistic in that they believed in many gods. This was an attempt by these societies to make sense of the natural world. Each god represented either a particular element, the sky, the seas, the lands, or indeed parts of the land. 
what they did when they could not understand a force of nature, they identified this as a god. That is a power beyond their understanding. Most of these gods are very different from divinities uh, that we know today. These gods are not particularly benevolent gods. They're not gods that exist or are assumed to be beneficial to man. The pyramids, majestic reminders of the cult of personality and the enormous power of Egyptian pharaohs. We normally tend to divide these areas between religious sphere, political sphere, economic sphere, cultural sphere, and so on. Ancient societies didn't think about religion in that way. Religion was something closely connected with everyday life, closely connected with human society, with politics, with culture. Though the pharaohs were flesh and blood, they were considered gods on earth and part of the divine family of about 2,000 gods. Mummification, embalming, and the pyramids were all meant to preserve their remains. Belief in the afterlife shaped the lives of ancient Egyptians. From the archaeological evidence, it seems to suggest that the Egyptians were obsessed with the afterlife. We must temper that a little bit by thinking in terms of regeneration, because a lot of the Egyptian stories of their gods deal with death and resurrection. This idea that preservation of body is important because it somehow ensures a future life. We'll also see in this idea something that has direct political implications. Because what it means that when a king, pharaoh, dies, that he somehow still exists, ensuring the survival and well-being of the state and its stability. Maybe we can look at the afterlife as something that actually is there to ensure stability and well-being of their society and their state. We take for granted that most religions today worship only one divine entity, but our ancient forebears would have found the idea of one god as strange as we find the idea of many gods. Amenhotep the, the fourth tried to establish an early kind of monotheism, worshipping the Aten, which is the uh, solar disk, basically. That was an attempt at establishing, at introducing a sort of monotheism. That was an experiment he famously attempted right around 1000 BC, and it would not be seen again for another thousand years with the ancient Romans. When we look at various religious systems of both the ancient world and also modern world, uh, we actually don't find there monotheistic religions and then polytheistic religions. Actually, what we find in reality is that there is a variety of different religious systems that are somewhere in between those poles, between something that we could call strict monotheism and then a polytheistic system or even some religious systems that don't even have a god or gods. Christianity is one of those cases where uh, there is, technically speaking, one god, but then there is the concept of trinity. Uh, which is not really a completely uh, consequential monotheistic system. The religion of ancient Egypt certainly made a lasting impression. Today, we can see tangible remains of their faith. But what about the other great civilizations of the Mediterranean? The Greeks and Romans more or less believed in the same set of gods and goddesses. The Romans changed the names of the Greek gods so that Zeus became Jupiter, Poseidon became Neptune, and so on. But the underlying principle was the same. The gods were believed to be one big happy family. Or were they? They're brothers, sisters, sons, uncles. We have Jupiter and Juno, Zeus and Hera, actually brother and sister, husband and wife. That in itself is going to lead to complication. If we think of them in terms of a modern dysfunctional family, 
then we don't have any real problems in understanding the warring factions. Because like any family, they fight, they make up, they fall out again, they're in love with each other, they're out of love with each other. Though the Greek and Roman gods were overtaken by Christianity, they were never quite forgotten. Christianity is a synthetic religion. It borrowed from ancient religion a great deal. It borrowed from ancient philosophy because during the evolution and changes in the Roman Empire, the elite class and the literate class eventually, as the population become more and more literate, abandoned their devotion, their recognition of the ancient gods and religious practices, and turned more and more to philosophy. Hellenism was introduced into the Roman cultural world in the third, fourth centuries BC. And uh, Hellenism means Greekism, making Greek concepts, Greek thoughts, Greek architecture, Greek philosophy, uh, Greek language, the universal, broad, cosmopolitan culture. It's not unlike Americanism today. And speaking of Americanism, where would the most powerful economies of today be without their wealth? Superpowers are not built on ideals alone. Money is another cornerstone on which society is built. The New York Stock Exchange, Wall Street. On an average trading day, Shares worth billions of dollars are bought and sold here. The bidding wars taking place on the bustling market floor may look modern, but they have their origins in something much older. Prior to using money, what we call money, as an exchange instrument, the economy rested and moved on the basis of exchange of goods. From its inception, money was a way of simplifying trade. Money made it easier to calculate the value of products. There is no fundamental difference between those ancient civilizations and the way we think about money and what money brings nowadays. We can actually see that very often, as we all know, money and social and political power go hand in hand. It is widely believed that the first gold coin to be used as currency was created by Lydian King Croesus around 550 BCE. He lived in the territory of Lydia, where he was king, and that's a center of trade. That is in the southwest of Asia Minor, of Turkey today. That's where many different cultures met there. The Phoenicians to the south, to the north, the Hittites, to the west, uh, people from Cyprus and even Egypt. Coins allow a statement of value where all of these people can trade with one another and they know that there is a given value to a particular instrument. It didn't take long before the divisions between rich and poor, have and have nots, began to emerge among human beings living in settlements. Today's hedonistic life lovers can trace their spiritual ancestors to the sensualists and pleasure seekers of ancient Rome. But even then, having a great deal of money was never enough. You were expected to flaunt it while doing anything to acquire more. Though the ethos of conspicuous consumption was not the noblest footprint of civilization, there's no doubt it had staying power.
the access to elegance, uh, the access to gold, the access to wealth, to money, to perfumes, for example, and so on, it's really connected to the social class uh, you come from. So this is a footprint of civilization. The fact that uh, the higher is the social class you belong to and uh, the easier is uh, the way you can access or can have access to these kinds of uh, products or materials such as marble, gold, amber. Today the difference in social class is a little bit uh, smaller or lighter than uh, it was or than it used to be at the times of the Romans or the Egyptians. The uh, wealthy social class uh, was much smaller as far as the ancient civilizations are concerned than uh, it is uh, nowadays. It was much more diverse and we have cases where actually people at the bottom of the social pyramid, that they acquire wealth, even slaves acquiring wealth both in Greece and in Rome, that would allow them to buy their freedom and then they could be free citizens and participate in trade or even in political life. Today, the wealthiest people in the world control the markets because they are the markets. The people who influence all the power in the world have a net worth of billions and billions of dollars. They're not the first. The net worth of Marcus Licinius Crassus was said to equal the budget of the Roman treasury. Obviously Crassus, famous right before the end of the, the fall, the collapse of the Roman Republic, often referred to as perhaps the wealthiest human being, at least in the ancient world, if not maybe all of human history. Centuries before Marcus Crassus, and certainly by the time of the old kingdom of Egypt, class distinctions were set in stone. At the top of the social pyramid was the pharaoh, nothing less than a living god. Next came members of the nobility, followed by high priests and government officials, all the way down to the slave class. The question was, is one's fate decided the day of one's birth or was social mobility possible even in those times? There wasn't much of an upwardly mobile class in ancient Egypt, but later civilizations had a little more room for self-improvement. Ancient Greece, not even somewhere between ancient Egypt and ancient Rome, was just very different. Ancient Greece, city-states, never a unified monolith like the Roman Empire would become a number of city-states with vestiges, at least vestiges, of tribalism. Therefore, everything is kept local, but as one might imagine, within such a reality as a tribe, even if it sound a little better calling it a city-state, there certainly will be elements of that class distinction within each city-state in ancient Greece, but not on the vast level that it would have been, certainly in ancient Egypt, or the class disparity in ancient Rome. Within the context of Roman civilization, there was the possibility to pass or to shift from one social class to the other. We also need to bear in mind that uh, some VIPs, like uh, emperors, for example, very often uh, came from uh, such high rank. Diocletian, for example, he came from a poor family from uh, Dalmatia, but also Augustus, the famous uh, Emperor Augustus, the first uh, Roman Emperor, came from a uh, family, the gens Octavia, which used to be of uh, plebeian uh, origin. Later on, we no longer find Roman Emperors being Roman or indeed Italian. We have Spaniards, Trajan and Hadrian, becoming emperors, and we have emperors from North Africa, for example, Septimius Severus. In ancient times, being born a male was another distinction that marked one out for advancement. 
Let's compare the role of women between those societies and today. We keep forgetting that in most of the Western societies, women acquired the same legal status only in the 20th century and in some of them only uh, by the mid 20th century. So that's less than one uh, average human life. Ancient Greece is widely acknowledged as the birthplace of democracy. But a democracy where voting was a privilege extended only to property-owning men and excluded women. Women behind the scenes could be dominating the household by the way they run the household. But we have to think in terms that the wife could be divorced by a word from the husband and dismissed from the house, and a daughter was considered a father's property, and when the daughter was married off, the wife became the property of her future husband. So in many ways that seems to limit the woman's role in society. However, in practical terms, that doesn't seem to have been the case. Sadly, human nature probably hasn't changed all that much. Undoubtedly, there have been strong women ever since there have been women. They very often were part of myth or mythology. If we consider the example of the Amazons, of uh, which Herodotus uh, speaks, uh, so we have an interesting example of women who were considered to be very strong, very powerful. We can also mention important individuals who, although strictly speaking, were not part of the ruling class, but were equally influential. Uh, famous mothers, wives, who actually very often led to important conflicts. We can mention they are also Cleopatra, who appeared at that crucial moment in Roman history when basically two leading generals were part of the story about Cleopatra and the succession of the Roman throne, essentially at the beginning of this period that we call Empire. The infamous Cleopatra was, effectively, the last pharaoh of Egypt. Scholars believe that up to six women may have ruled ancient Egypt, either in partnership with the pharaoh or on their own as empress. Among them, Nethhotep, who Egyptologists have deduced by the colossal size of her mastaba, or tomb, and her royal crest, that she was the de facto ruler of the first dynasty of Egypt. Then there was Merneith, at first an empress regent, who then possibly ruled in her own right during the first dynasty of Egypt. And Sobekneferu, who ruled Egypt for four years after the death of her brother Amenemhat IV. Nefertiti, she of the famous bust, is believed to have ruled as regent with her pharaoh husband, Akhenaten. There are interesting connections that we can make uh, between the role of women uh, in the classical times or in uh, the ancient times and the role, the role of women today, if we consider the role of uh, contemporary uh, female uh, politicians. We see how relevant uh, their uh, ideas, the policies that they try to develop uh, actually is. Male or female, make no mistake, the pharaohs of ancient Egypt were absolute rulers. To oppose them was to oppose the will of the gods. When would ordinary citizens get to have a say in their own affairs? The foundations for the modern day concept of people equality. Democracy, famously forged in Athens, Greece in the eighth century BCE rule by the crowd, rule by the mob, quite literally, which has the unfortunate consequence that if out of any given number of people, a simple majority rules the day. Around 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece, the populace worked out a way of governing themselves 
a concept we recognize today as democracy. A regular and compulsory gathering of male citizens met at the assembly. There, anyone could speak, including proposing laws. These laws would be debated by the Council of 500, made up of citizens chosen at random to serve in government. Not unlike our jury duty today. And finally, there was the court. This was true people power, or more correctly, man power. One thing to keep in mind that uh, all these democracies were in some sense restricted. So women and slaves were excluded. Aristotle himself said the slaves were, were just walking animals, were talking and walking animals. So the Greeks had a very, very firm and strong hierarchy which never changed. You, no way, you could live forever in Greece as a foreigner, and there were many foreigners you could never enter and identify as a Greek. As they so often did, the Romans took from the Greeks in adapting their own democratic system. The ancient Romans modified, tweaked the Greek model of democracy, inventing a little something known as the Constitutional Republic, right, which is a representative democracy, among other things, allowing for the minorities within such a society to nevertheless have a voice. The Roman Republic, with its consuls and senate, and its ideas of checks and balances on power, was destined to last a long time. The Republic would endure for nearly 500 years. The Senate would still have an important role in running the empire, even after the rise of the emperors. The Roman governing system has been emulated for centuries. In fact, the establishment of the highly esteemed United States Senate was influenced by the Roman model. The three quarters of the world today has uh, Roman law. So in some way, Roman law uh, penetrates the mentality and the social structures, uh, classes of those societies. The ancient Romans' point of departure in Roman law was finding equitable, balanced, harmonious, as best as possible solutions for all members of human society, not based on religion, divine revelation, or any particular philosophical model, but based on a rational, logical approach, critical thinking. The other thing is exactly what Roman law has always been lauded to have produced. That is, things like justice, freedom, liberty, equality, equitability, are fruits of Roman law. So the idea that uh, uh, nobody should be sentenced uh, to any uh, any penalty before he or she has the right to defend themselves in a public court is something that we would still, at least theoretically, affirm nowadays. Together with that, we should also keep in mind another important concept of citizenship, because citizenship defined who are those who have certain rights within a certain political community. Uh, initially, uh, a Roman citizen was, of course, just a free citizen of Rome, no matter what class. There were also procedures uh, through which even slaves could become uh, Roman citizens. And as the empire grew, uh, it actually uh, started applying the concept of citizenship to more and more people, including people who are of different ethnic origins. The road to political power in the Roman Senate was, naturally, different for wealthy patricians than for lower-class plebeians. The manner in which the Roman democratic system, such as it was, operated, fostered a clear path to corruption, favoritism, and double-dealing. Perhaps some of that sounds familiar. Roman and Greek society is predicated upon a huge slave population. We mustn't think of slaves as one blanket nation. The slaves could be manual laborers or they could be refined teachers of rhetoric in an elaborate household. They could be gladiators or they could be road workers. There were, in fact, times when people rose up against the system they were under. One obvious example was the slave revolt led by Spartacus, and another is Tiberius Gracchus.
what the Gracchi brothers uh, try to do, basically to give some portion of uh, uh, land uh, to those who didn't have, so it's uh, rather modern. So there is a kind of footprint of civilization. Why? Because uh, there is a modern kind of attitude in uh, the attempt to equalize social classes, in the attempt to give something to those who didn't have that much, and in the attempt to try to limit the way in which wealthiest classes were trying to become uh, even wealthier. Even democracy has its downside. There are many visible footprints of repeated human mistakes and failings. The rise of the strong man who overthrows democracy, the ascension to power through the ballot box, only to have democracy undermined from within. These are the political staples of the 20th century and the parallels in the downfall of Julius Caesar. For the Romans, the dictatorship was an emergency measure in extremis, when the political situation, usually foreign policy, had broken down, somebody was needed to come in who was all-powerful, who could literally dictate, say, how things were going to be. And the original office was just for six months. Caesar may have seen himself as a benevolent dictator, However, that's virtually a contradiction in terms. He first of all makes himself dictator for five years and then dictator in perpetuity. That is, he's made himself a king. Caesar was murdered ostensibly to save the Republic. Sadly, the civil war that followed produced unintended consequences for his assassins. The Senate would still wield some power in Roman society, but Rome would from now on be ruled by imperial dynasties. Though Rome had been a republic for nearly 500 years, it would be known for its highest achievements and excess during the first 400 years of its empire. History always seems to repeat itself. The Roman emperors left their indelible footprints on our civilization. Following Germany's loss in World War I, the town of Weimar declared itself a republic. They drafted a Bill of Rights that gave men and women the right to vote and also protected freedom of speech and religious beliefs. So far, so good. But we all know what happened next. A system of proportional representation allowed fringe parties like the National Socialist Party to gain a foothold on power. A clause in the new constitution allowed the elected president to use extraordinary powers in an emergency. Ironically, what constituted an emergency wasn't defined. Hitler exploited this weakness in the clause, and as a consequence, the world would suffer. In contemporary times, I would say that some elements of some what are referred to these days as populist movements are very similar to some of the ideals within ancient Greek democracy. Power back to the people. Again, the problem being that sometimes that can be taken to an extreme or certainly a non-productive productive path. What, in fact, does democracy need of society in order to work? The answer is people. Today, big populations made up of different ethnic groups with varying beliefs live together in the same town. Is that a modern concept or an ancient one? Can we find another footprint of civilization?
In the ancient world, the separate nations of Egypt, Greece, and Rome seemed more like they came from different worlds. The Egyptians built pyramids. The Greeks debated democracy. And the Romans lived to excess in their villas. But reality was infinitely more complicated. Trade, war, and population migration would cause the ancient peoples to intermingle as they traveled. Arguably, there were multicultural empires even before. If we think about Persia, uh, Persian Empire was uh, multicultural and was also pretty, from what we know, pretty tolerant when it comes to the existence of various ethnicities and various religious groups uh, within the Persian Empire. Uh, then we also have, of course, uh, Magna Grecia, which was uh, primarily a uh, Greek empire, but was encompassing all these regions with a variety of local traditions and, and different ethnicities. And we have a Roman Empire, which uh, was one case that is closest to us and most significant for the later history of the West, uh, for which we can truly say that it was something uh, open to inclusion of various cultures, various ideas, various, we could call it, lifestyles uh, nowadays. A legendary story about the beginnings of multiculturalism comes from Macedonia and of its legendary warrior king, Alexander the Great. Alexander, of course, was a great conqueror. Indeed, the great conqueror. His empire included Greece, Macedonia, the Middle East, and most of Egypt all the way to Afghanistan. In keeping with the standard practice of his era, whenever he conquered a territory, he infused it with the Greek language and its custom. Something else was also true. As a rule, he and his armies never sought to absorb the cultures they encountered. One exception was Persia. Though Alexander thought them to be his bitter enemy, he sought to unite the two peoples with a mass wedding that lasted five days. He had many of his generals married off to Persian noblewomen. The Macedonian Persian marriages were intended to be symbolic, but also to unite these rival nations in blood. After all, any new offspring would be children of both civilizations. I'm afraid he favored, like all the Greeks, um, a very narrow definition of a society, uh, the ethnic basis of a society. Uh, I do not think that this famous incident uh, where he married off his officers uh, to local women uh, is um, a very valid basis for saying he uh, was creating a multi-ethnic empire. But subsequently, he becomes a symbol of that, interestingly enough. At the very least, it was short-lived and a failed attempt because of his own death, and perhaps the greater proof that human society was not quite yet ready for such an experiment is precisely because his own generals wound up immediately in fighting and basically destroying what Alexander had created. It really would not be until really the ancient Roman Empire that for the first time what we could identify to be a multicultural experience within one societal governmental reality exists and that is one of the genius inventions of the Romans. The Romans realized and capitalized on the notion that let's not be exclusive Rather, let's be uh, inclusive. When the Romans conquered a new province, they really didn't tamper with government that much. They put in their own governor. But as long as the native government worked and worked well, the Romans left well alone. I think this, uh, this model 
uh, was proven very successful because it allowed, instead of exclusion of everybody who had a little bit of different religious practice or ethnicity or even language, to be included into empire and then toward uh, the third century uh, AD uh, to come to the situation when all these different ethnicities can actually climb up to the very top of the social structure and still be considered Romans and uh, the state still be considered the Roman state. Sport is one activity that has always brought people together. The modern Olympic Games, a testament to humankind's ability to temporarily put their differences aside and compete. The ideals of friendship, solidarity and fair play have become known as the Olympic spirit. obviously begun uh, in the ancient world, in ancient Greece in particular, and it would last until effectively shortly before the collapse of the Roman Empire, so at least a thousand years. Everything stopped in that period in August for the Olympic Games once every four years. Huge crowds were attracted to Olympia for the Games. Sure, there was money involved, betting, all those things we associate with modern sports, people were making money on it. But for better and for worse, it was a real recognition of human individuals' need and a collective need to ultimately realize we're all in this together. And that maybe somehow through a competitive, a sporting, but also sportsman's like attempt at engaging one another, regardless of race, race, ethnicity, uh, geographical location, class in society, uh, wealth, that we can all recognize that we're all human beings and we're all, we're all part of something much greater than ourselves. Sprints and horse races were the events of the first recorded games that took place in Olympia in 776 BCE. Longer foot races were added later, as were sprints wearing full armor. Eventually added were track and field events that combined running, throwing and jumping into multi-event competitions. The pentathlon comprised five such events, and the decathlon was made up of ten events. The major difference between the games was the brutality of the ancient games. Um, bare knuckle fighting for the boxing, the wrestling, again not allowing eyes or biting, and then the ultimate kickboxing wrestling mixture, the pancration, which was a fight that could all could and did sometimes lead to the death of one of the competitors. Nevertheless, the popularity of boxing has never waned, continuing to attract millions of enthusiasts without regard to ethnic origin or socioeconomic status. The best and worst of human nature was on full display in the ancient world. Those empires or those states or those societies that uh, were proven to be successful at least in a certain uh, period of time that they grew, uh, grew economically, culturally and also politically. It's all very well for us to judge their folly, cruelty and excesses But what would they make of ours?
Uh, there's never been a time in history uh, since antiquity when the values, the movement of people, the diversity of people, the encounter of cultures has ever been greater than today. Perhaps it's safer to commemorate their considerable achievements and the footsteps of civilization they left behind. Ancient society multifaceted has given us good points and some bad points. We've learned from the good points, we've refined the idea of democracy into an all-inclusive idea with votes across gender, race and creed. At the dawn of the space age, during the 1950s and 60s, it was generally assumed that by the 21st century, we would be eating our food in pill form. And yet, here we are, still shopping at the farmer's market for fresh produce. Dietitians may be able to accurately measure the nutritional value of a tomato, but somehow, a vitamin pill is no substitute. You may be surprised at just how much of our techniques in agriculture, horticulture, and fishing have remained essentially unchanged since ancient times. There was a lot more to ancient farming and fishing than loaves and fish, grapes and figs. As long as the human race needs to feed itself, these early footprints of civilization will remain. In many ways, we have it so easy. We pick out what we want to eat and drink as we cruise the supermarket aisles or surf the net. It's all there, packaged and labeled, even delivered right to the door. Still, it can be tough putting food on the table. Just talk to your ancestors from tens of thousands of years ago. They could tell you a thing or two about hardship. Early humans may not have had much variety in their diet, but they survived, though the odds were against them. We have many lessons to learn from the ancient world. Imagine, for example, their water management and how they succeed in growing products. Greatest probably innovation in agriculture took place in the Mediterranean, in fact, and mostly in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, that is Western Asia, when uh, grains uh, were domesticated. So it's still very important today, yes, of course. I mean, it's becoming increasingly important. Agriculture is still important because we are taking and receiving from agriculture all that we use for our living, basically. And the beginnings of agriculture mark the beginnings of civilization. The connection between literature and farming on the developments in agriculture are fascinating. We have a whole series of early literature that is based around the shepherd, for example, and the shepherd's produce, the shepherd's day. To understand the impact of ancient agriculture, we must first travel to a time before history. It would be quite a journey from early hunter-gatherers. 
to the food orgies of ancient Rome. But these footprints of civilization are with us every day. Planet Earth. According to the United Nations, there are around 7.6 billion people on our blue-green planet. That's a lot of hungry mouths to feed. Worldwide production of grain in 2017 to 2018 came to about 12.38 million metric tons. That's a stupendously large bowl of cereal. Modern methods of grain production use advanced agricultural equipment, irrigation, fertilizers, and pesticides. And to think, it all began with someone planting the first seed. Europe around 40,000 years ago. To get here, early Homo sapiens had to traverse a great distance, having come out of Africa. It's estimated that as few as only 10,000 completed the trek. The rest had not survived the perilous journey. Once they got to the new lands, there were new challenges to face. Our ancestors had to compete with other primate species for the territories of Eurasia like Homo erectus and Neanderthal man. As they were a nomadic species, Homo sapiens kept moving from place to place, hunting and gathering all along the way. Very often these men of the Paleolithic also uh, scavenged organs or the fat from animals that had been killed by much larger animals. So they had, you know, different uh, ways of acquiring food for acquiring calories from the mammals, basically. Then, around 10,000 years ago, someone had the idea to try something different. They planted a seed in the ground. Well, it's all about taming nature, isn't it? It's, it's beginning to think about man's place within the natural world. Taming the natural world, taming animals, taming the earth, taming the waters, and making a comfortable living for oneself. You have these uh, changes and the transformation of societies, the settling down of people in more permanent villages that become sometimes cities. We also know that these first, let's say, revolution happen in uh, the area of Mesopotamia, the Middle East, and Anatolia. Though we'll never know who came up with this idea, it took off and spread quickly throughout the entire world. The planted seeds of wheat, rice, and corn meant that future Homo sapiens could stop their ceaseless wandering and live off the land. They had the possibility and at the same time the need to experience what could they make with this regular staple. Not anymore maybe simple boiling, but more complex process such as bread making where you know you have the dough and you have all the process involved. With the Industrial Revolution, of course, in modern time, since the 19th century and uh, right up to our own time, Storage now has become way beyond what the fresh foods that are available. So what we're struggling with in the contemporary diet is this lack of balance. On the one hand, we are overwhelmed with food that has been stored, prepared foods. On the other hand, fresh foods become less and less available and more and more expensive because agriculture has become industrial, the process of storage has become more sophisticated, a lot of the fresh foods we had before totally disappeared. 
So actually there is a kind of evolution towards the past rather than towards the future in terms of what we want to eat. Today we are looking for healthier food, for a food that can sustain in a more natural way. We are basically going towards the employment of techniques of methodologies that were already employed by our ancestors. Evidence suggests there were wheat fields in the Fertile Crescent at least 9,000 years ago. Those first farmers essentially lived on a vegetarian diet, whether they liked it or not. Once humans gained some mastery over the land, they went about the domestication of pigs, sheep, goats, and cattle. Today it's called animal husbandry. Probably around 6,000 BC, 8 to 6,000 BC, what we might call wild sheep were domesticated and goats. This was a major lift to the daily diet. Uh, in addition to sheep and goats, which were domesticated, uh, this led, of course, to the production of milk. One of the first settlements from the Neolithic age points to the very beginnings of agriculture and civilization as we know it. It's Çatalhöyük in Turkey, and it overlooks the Konya Plain, southeast of the present-day city of Konya. Today, Agricultural scientists continue to use selective breeding of animals as they seek to make the animal's muscles leaner or their milk richer. But how far can we take the science of animal breeding? Imagine an ancient ancestor sitting around with a full belly he got thanks to farming. He never could have imagined the footprints of civilization he was leaving behind. Farming made civilization a natural possibility. Essentially, without agriculture, there'd be no culture. The early literatures talking about the songs of the herdsmen, the songs of the drovers, the songs of the shepherds. We see farming so intimately connected with the development of literature that it is fascinating. Without farming and the tallying of the herds, we don't get an alphabet developing. Sumeria was an urban population, therefore it follows the pattern of city development, urban development and therefore a dependency on outside sources of food. So you can well imagine that there we have now a trading element in society. People who are bringing the food in from the rural areas, trading, marketing in the urban areas. Uh, well, this demands uh, some kind of record keeping. Who is buying and who is selling and all this has becomes uh, suddenly important. Uh, so the Kuna Farm script was uh, developed uh, to make those recordings. The Sumerians, who lived in the part of the world now known as Iraq, were one of the first true civilizations in world history. 11,000 years ago, Sumerian farmers began to grow the cereals barley and wheat. The earliest farmers uh, would develop their uh, agricultural enterprises within a specific geographical location. This is uh, Mesopotamia, the land between the two uh, rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. In many parts of the uh, Middle East yet today, you will see scenarios where these grains are being planted, harvested, as they were 10,000 years ago. It's only with the development of agricultural machinery that that has changed at all. And that's, in terms of the overall development of agriculture, this is very recent indeed. And so what puts a great deal of stress into the production of agriculture and food is, of course, the growth of population. While Sumerians were growing their crops, flocks of wild sheep were being herded in the Zagros mountain range. On today's maps, the Zagros mountain range lies predominantly in Iran. 
Then, about 6,500 years ago, the invention of the plow took farming to a whole new level, despite the invention initially being made out of the wrong material. The plow was uh, basically made of wood. That's not the best technology for uh, producing a high amount of food products. The modern farmer would recognize the still today, the basic technology in uh, grain production and food production, certainly agricultural pr production, uh, is the plow. Around this time, wool was first used for textiles and clothing. The footprints of civilization are found woven into the shirt on your back. Today's global fashion industry generates $3 trillion, or 2% of the world's gross domestic product annually. Here's another way to think of it. The fashion industry, including clothing and textiles, currently employs around 60 million people. During the agricultural revolution, that was more than the entire human population of the world. The first agricultural revolution quietly developed over the course of 3,500 years, but its footprints are still with us. Agriculture transformed humankind and made everything else that came after it possible. It's inescapable. A society that has trouble feeding itself isn't going to last long. Agriculture's upside was clear, but living off the land and living so close to animals was not without its side effects. Every footprint of civilization also has a shadow. The proximity to cattle, to their uh, daily agricultural uh, activities and to the land itself, uh, all these also generated concrete threat of being transmitted with different kinds of disease and uh, infections. Uh, like in recent cases of uh, bird flu or infections transmitted by pigs, for example. Still the great killer. That is malaria, that is our water and the presence of water and mosquitoes. But it has shifted other elements of agriculture where agriculture may be related to modern ills and maladies comes largely from prepared foods. Not from the fresh food so much or world, but to industrial foods. So prepared foods uh, can often contain, of course, if they're not well prepared, bacteria, which uh, can be deathly. The pressure on farmers and agriculturalists to produce massive, massive, on a mass scale, food products, particularly in animals, has caused such diseases as mad cow disease. Nevertheless, by 3500 BCE, farming had spread far across Eurasia. In only a few thousand years, sometimes for better and sometimes worse, humans have totally transformed this planet. In evolutionary terms, that's a blink of an eye. An example of this transformation is the Palm Islands in Dubai. These islands were artificially created, relying on the ancient method of irrigation. Around the world, there are many such examples that were created using ancient agricultural techniques. The ancients were the first to transform their environment from arid to arable soil. Now, in the not too distant future, man plans to leave the footprints of our current civilization on another planet. Contemporary scientists are working on ways to affect the climate of Mars, hoping to increase its atmospheric carbon dioxide pressure. This would have the effect of warming Mars 
and make it possible to successfully colonize. By increasing its atmospheric carbon dioxide pressure, a process called terraforming, we can also build up the red planet's atmosphere and water content, which would give us the ability to irrigate it. It's a very lofty ambition. NASA estimates that in order to make Mars habitable, it would take 400 years of terraforming and a mere $4 trillion. Thousands of years ago, ancient Egyptian farmers had a more modest goal. They sought to produce enough food to feed their population. In order to accomplish that, they would have to do some terraforming of their own. I'm rather skeptical about that. Why? Because you basically don't have all the conditions that you would have here on the other planet. What is possible to say, however, is that what our ancestors did in Egypt or in Mesopotamia in terms of making those lands habitable and good for producing crops. So this was a real enterprise because those populations did not really have the instruments, the tools, the technical methodologies that we have today. Without benefit of an instruction manual, the Egyptians terraformed along the Nile River. Practically everything they did was being done for the first time. They grew crops along the banks of that river. The crops benefited from the annual floods that left behind Kemet, a rich black soil. This fertile soil was ideal for growing healthy crops. In its own way, Egyptian agriculture was as much of an achievement as the building of the pyramids. It became important very early for the Egyptians to understand how to deal with their river in order to employ the water of the river itself to grow their crops and to grow grain along the river valley. The Egyptians grew wheat, barley, vegetables, figs, melons, pomegranates, and vine. They also grew flax, which was then made into linen. Grain was certainly a versatile crop. The ancient Egyptians relied on it for their staple diet of bread, porridge, and beer. Egyptian farmers also grew vegetables, including cabbage, beans, cucumbers, lettuce, onions, and leeks. Through century after century, it's a way of life that hasn't really changed all that much. Famous for their canal system and their invention of the shadoof, they may have been the first to use the water wheel. They attached a bucket to a long pole at one end and put a weight at the other end. The buckets were dropped into the Nile, filled with water, and raised up with water wheels. An ingenious device. Traveling along the Nile today, you can still see the shadoof in use. A footprint of civilization well, let's just say, if it's not broken, why fix it? It should be even more important. It should be a knowledge as more important, of course, a form of sustainable agriculture. And again, we have uh, many lessons to learn from the ancient world, even in drier regions of the world that they control, using smart water infrastructures that were sustainable. Whereas today, as you know, with all the technology, the water has become more accessible, but that has also led to many problems in making the area more arid than before. So this is a real footprint of civilization because uh, how people still use uh, the water of their rivers, uh, how people still employ the water of their rivers uh, today is very similar to how people of the ancient civilizations uh, used to uh, deal with the same aspect of their uh, economical life.
These days, we rely on sophisticated equipment and techniques to predict flooding, including data sensors, telemetry equipment, and satellite-assisted weather forecasting. But believe it or not, the ancient Egyptians invented the very first flood warning system. It was called the Nilometer. It measured the Nile and predicted its flooding. Between the peak of Egyptian culture and the start of the Roman Empire, Greece came to prominence as a culture and civilization. During that time, one item always seemed to be on the menu, regardless of the meal, cereal. The irony that footprints of civilization lead to the modern breakfast bar is unmistakable. In the Odyssey by Homer, the diet of the Greeks was depicted as pretty monotonous. The bulk of the grain cultivated was barley, which was turned into porridge or ground into flour to make bread. We know that they had a three meal organization during the day, very early at dawn, to make the most of natural light and get ready to work in the field. So that's the equivalent of a breakfast, but their typical food for this first meal would include some uh, cheese, some even uh, fruit like figs, and uh, some bread, and then they would be ready to go to work. Lunch did exist, but it was a minor meal. Sometime available directly uh, where they were was what they consumed. Later in the evening, there was the dinner, it's called Depnon. That was definitely their most important meal. And this is when people who could afford would have a little bit more of a variety. Perhaps their diet explains all those six-pack stomachs on ancient statues. Back then, farming was not an easy way to make a living. Some things never change. But in ancient Greece, the amount of good soil and cropland was limited. The Greeks relied very heavily on grains and fish in their diet. Olive oil, for example, also. In fact, they developed the olives from what was a pit the size of one small finger into the magnificent variety of olives we still have today. So olives were a great consumption. You could have some meat if the family was well off. Olive oil was very present, and um, it is known that olive oil and wine were very important component of their diet, not only because, of course, they make everything tastier and more pleasant, but because given the poverty and the limitation of their diet, these two extra ingredients supply vitamins for olive oil and uh, some other uh, substances that otherwise would be lacking from what was a very basic repetitive diet. When grapes were harvested, they might be consumed as raw fruit or dried into raisins, or of course used in wine production. It sounds like the modern Mediterranean diet, a healthy diet emulated for centuries that is still fashionable. How civilized. When the Greeks discovered the grape, which was wild at the time, also it was no more than a pit, the end of your finger, and they developed to the grapes more or less that we know today. Now we have many more varieties of grapes because of modern agriculture, but in large part, the wines we know today, are the various kinds of grapes that make various kinds of wines, were known to antiquity also. Wine production was extraordinarily important, as it was also for medic used as medical purposes and other cooking, for example. They cooked a lot with food and wine, of course, and drank it all the time. Ancient Greek farms, called stenochoria, were generally small, consisting of four or five acres of land. The farmers could grow enough food to support their families and perhaps a small surplus to sell in the local market. But there were some larger farms. These were generally run by farm managers, so the gentlemen farmers who owned those farms could live it up in the city. 
One record showed such a farmer making 30,000 drachmas a year from his estate. By contrast, the average worker could expect to make just two drachmas a day. The big food corporations and consortiums of today have an enormous share of the world's wealth. There are, in fact, just 10 companies that control practically all the well-known food and beverage brands in the world. Look, cereal again. These companies employ thousands of people and rake in combined revenues of over $350 billion per year. In ancient times, growing crops and tending livestock began as a matter of survival. But it didn't take long before men, being what they are, figured that food could do more than fill the bellies of their families. Food could be exchanged for goods and traded as a commodity in the market. Until the uh, Roman Empire does not appear to be any large uh, food consortium. After the Punic Wars, 146 BC, however, there is a strong development in agriculture here, certainly in Italy, because the land-based agriculture workers had been taken off the farms, recruited into the military to conduct the wars which extended from 264 BC to 146 BC, the continual wars which constructed uh, the Roman Empire. They were called latifundia, so large estates, exactly the translation. And we see this problem becoming bigger and bigger. They started with a limited group of elite families, the patricians, already controlling the best and the majority of the fields. The growth of the latifundia um, made it almost impossible for the smallholder to survive. If you have a small holding that is dependent upon a very small workforce, a husband, wife and the children growing up and working, and the husband and the elder sons are away because they've been conscripted into the army, then it's left to a very small and perhaps enfeebled workforce that can't maintain a small holding. Bread was the staple diet of Rome. Shortages of it could cause rioting or even rebellion. Thousands of years later, it's still something we see in the headlines of today. This became a very strong, a very uh, dangerous kind of uh, riot because the rioters uh, threatened the Roman senators, so they had to escape. This is meaningful to make us understand also the power of the masses uh, in Roman history. When the masses uh, gather, and put together their force and their power, they can really ask for more to their uh, lords and to the ones who are uh, politically responsible for their life. There are countries in our modern world whose inflated economies are spiraling out of control. In some places, this results in shortages of basic commodities like food and water. The desperate populations there have taken to the streets more than once. The result? Looters plundering food trucks and state-run supermarkets, and even slaughtering livestock. This isn't to suggest that food riots are a footprint of civilization, but Rome's eventual response to these shortages was, for once, actually quite civilized. The Romans created one of the earliest government welfare programs. It was the second century BCE, when some Roman senators established a wheat allowance for the poor. Tiberius Gracchus is probably the first Roman who realizes the disparity between the displaced smallholder and the huge estate owner and wants to do something about it. Of course, his 
fellow senators are very upset about this. They don't like the idea that their newfound wealth is being undercut by one of their own. Eventually, the only way that Tiberius can be stopped in his land reforms, which were not that revolutionary at the end of the day, was by murdering him. Consequently, these problems of food supply continued going on and on and on until Octavian seized Egypt from Cleopatra and Antony in 31 BC, and the Romans found themselves in all their glory occupying Egypt, the great food supply. The Romans began to bring enormous food supply from Egypt uh, grain, massive amounts of it. They developed ships that would carry massive amounts of this. They created a new port, Ostia Antica, to receive uh, that, those grain fleets. They created enormous storage facilities down along the Tiber River, which are still in ruins. They can be seen today. And near Testaccio, all along, are huge facilities for storing grain. So they had a food bank and they initiated a process of grain distribution uh, to the population of Rome of grain, oil, wine, and later in the empire they also distributed pork. There even was a state officer and a connected position to monitor constantly and make sure that there never was a break in this continuous supply of grain. It was called Annona, and it was an important office that responded to the emperor. Julius Caesar, a hard-headed man if ever there was, suggested people queuing for grain should be means tested. That practice continued for hundreds of years. These were the first ever food banks, something still seen around the world today. Though the Romans could doubtless be a cruel lot, they also set the scene for some forms of social justice. Let's take the example of the U.S. government. Uh, they have forever subsidized the agriculture in the United States and continue to do it. They must maintain a certain level of food supply. It's because that whole system, that distribution system, that production and distribution system is closely, closely controlled by governments. And of course, that's exactly the relationship uh, that the empire, the Roman emperors had in the ancient world. Their only legitimacy was the approval of the population. So they focused, unlike the Republic, they focused their attention, their favors on the population at large, and that's evident everywhere. The satirical poet Juvenal famously wrote that the Roman Empire was fueled by panamet curtensis, breads and circuses. Then as now, the rich and powerful, the high and mighty senate, the noble consul or proconsul, the all-powerful emperor, still depended on the good graces of the mob, or common people. And the people, said Juvenal with a sneer, could always be placated by two things, Panem et Kirkensis, bread and circuses. The trouble, of course, was that Juvenal was not suggesting this was a good thing. No, he was saying the common people were selfish, as well as being ignorant of and uninterested in civic duty. And the modern equivalent to bread and circuses could be junk food and violent video games, or maybe fad diets and social media addiction. Judge for yourself. This is a typical footprint of a civilization that we still find today pretty much employed in contemporary political situation. So the Romans used to, to provide their uh, people, the populace, with this, with Panem et uh, Circens, uh, meaning that people just received the little bit they needed in order to survive or not to starve in terms of food, and uh, they also were provided with some fun. The populace 
was ensured of a basic staple diet, grain to make bread or bread itself, and the amount of entertainment, either the gladiatorial shows or the circuses, that is the chariot racing, increased exponentially under the empire. The success of the Roman Empire and its march across the then known world owed a lot to bread and farming. The Romans typically capitalized on the tools and inventions of all other civilizations that had come before them. Well, it's because Rome production at all levels depended on slavery. And uh, where you have uh, slavery, a large supply of human labor, you're not uh, prompted, you're not inspired to create machines to replace those slaves. In fact, it could be dangerous. If we look at the big picture, slavery continued in the Western world right up to the Industrial Revolution. It was only machines, when machines were available, that replaced the slaves. This was an issue in the American Civil War, in fact, big issue. That is, the southern states did not and did not want to develop an industrial economy because the slaves would have to be freed. It would free the slaves. That was dangerous. In order to irrigate their crops and plants, as well as to sustain both animal and human life, the Romans built aqueducts, dams, and reservoirs to store and carry water. There are Roman aqueducts still functioning today in France, Spain, England, and Italy. The Aqua Virginae in Rome, for instance, which supplies water to the Trevi Fountains. The distribution of food and drink is one of the most important footsteps of civilization there is. But trade could only expand but so far over land. The sea provided bottomless food baskets, or so it seemed. They were teeming with life. All you had to do was get out there and catch it. In the modern world, the fishing industry is, to put it mildly, big business. In 2017, the worldwide weight of all the life hauled from the seas came to approximately 174 million metric tons. No wonder there are widespread concerns about the impact of fishing on the world's oceans. Demand is beginning to outpace supply. Contrast that perspective with how inexhaustible the ocean's bounty must have seemed at the outset of the global fishing trade. In terms of the ancient civilizations, I would mention the Phoenicians. So the Phoenicians really represents the earliest example of a civilization which is pretty much projected towards the sea. It was they were uh, inhabiting a very tiny strip of land which corresponds to what is nowadays uh, Lebanon, and uh, they had a very long uh, coastline. Not only were they the great navigators of the ancient world, but they also invented sea farming. This early uh, civilization uh, did not really have uh, so many instruments and tools. Uh, they could not rely on sophisticated tools in order to navigate through the sea. But anyway, they were already expert in terms of the knowledge that they had of the sky and how to uh, orientate uh, their uh, navigation according to precise points uh, in the sky, so according to stars uh, or according to the uh, constellations, and also according to the motion of uh, uh, the sun or the moon. The Romans will take the idea of sea farming to the nth degree, as they do with so much, had agricultural fisheries. I mean, it was tended to be for the exotic end of the market and the production of eels and lampreys for the senatorial tables, um, but it was still sea farming and fishing on an industrial scale. This famous fresco of a fisherman is from the excavation of the Minoan town of Akrotiri, located on the Greek island of Santorini. 
The volcano-ravaged ruins of this Minoan town tell us a lot about the first great seafaring nation of the Mediterranean, the Minoans. The Minoans were fantastic boat builders, great fishermen, and seagoing traders. We still admire the footprints they left behind of their civilization and their life at sea. We know, for example, the Minoans had almost an obsession with fish and the sea to the point of incorporating all kind of fish in the art, including the octopus and other variety of sea animals. We know that fish was an important component of the Greek diet. However, in the Greek world, we still see fish as a very humble activity. It is with the Roman period that we witness a more industrial approach to fishing comparable to our more modern idea. The great fishing vessels of today. Trawlers catch large volumes of fish in their nets. Some of them are still fishing for tuna off the coast of Sicily. In ancient times, Sicily was an outpost of Greece. There's a poetry about life at sea, then and now. Modern man mustn't plunder the oceans with the abandon of our ancestors, but the ocean's food baskets will, most likely, help feed the world for centuries to come. If it were not for the early pioneers in agriculture, including irrigation, horticulture, and viniculture, we might still be roaming the wild, hunting for our dinner. So with agriculture and the developments in agriculture came civilization. Civilization through mathematics, counting the herds, and into literature, the development of alphabets, etc. So pull up a chair and raise a glass to the footprints of civilization, which still lead us from the plate and the palate. What could be more civilized than that? Man's appetite has not changed uh, in all these thousand years. It may have grown a lot, <laughs> uh, it may have diversified, but food is the central item uh, on the agenda all through history. The human animal. It just loves to converse, to communicate. And these days we have more ways than ever to connect, communicate, and converse. There is some concern about how much time we spend on our devices, but in so many ways, we're just doing what we've always done, sending out messages. The ancient Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans were always communicating. It's one important reason why we know as much about them as we do. These were people who had something significant to communicate, which is why their footprints of civilization are still with us today. Communications, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, they're all evolving so fast.
Before you know it, we'll see technology that can read your mind. But don't look now, because it looks like that already exists. In 2017, research scientists at MIT announced that they had created a brain decoding device. In the ancient world, the only form of communication available to most people was the spoken word. There was no email, but you might send out a pigeon or set out for days on horseback to deliver a message. Whether it's oral, verbal, written, visual, whichever it may be, everyone has to agree on certain basic vehicles of communication. Communication is what makes us human. We wouldn't be humans if we were not speaking, if we were not communicating to each other our thoughts, our emotions. The history of language and the birth and the development of different languages is a testament to the importance of communication for the human being. The biggest leap in civilization is the shift from the spoken to the written word. The ability to write something down and to have records that can be consulted. The moment when humans do not rely entirely on memory. When it came to the way we communicate, the footsteps of civilization had to travel a long and difficult road. In the ancient world, we have huge collections of letters, so there was a primitive postal service, and these letters were not only intended to be read by the recipient, but also later gathered together for publication. So we know that there was an exchange of letters on a social level, but also transmitting ideas between city-states, between armies, between generals on the battlefield. Communication was extremely important, but in those cases, rather than the written word, a lot of it was the spoken word. Regardless of cultures, in terms of maximizing and expediting the communication of any message, the Romans had it down bar none, more than the Greeks, more than the Persians, more than the Egyptians primarily because of other things like the network of Roman roads. Keep in mind that long after the first alphabets emerged, most people wouldn't have been able to read any arriving message. The problem of uh, literacy is uh, one of the most uh, intriguing and important uh, uh, problems for the historians. We can say that uh, as far as Egypt uh, is concerned, uh, for instance, uh, probably 5% of the population could read a text. And the, and the very small percentage of the population that could read, I and mean, we were talking about 5% maximum, 10% at most of a literate public, so not everybody of course could read and write. It's not much different between Greece and Rome as far as I know. So we have a small population that could read and write, very, very small, and a small population that would actually understand the great literature that is being produced in this period. Yet the early and ingenious communicators truly blazed a trail for all the advances in communications yet to come. Sending a message. It's something most of us do every day. Press a button and your message is sent via radio waves to a control tower and then to the intended recipient's device. But while creating and sending messages wasn't always as easy as pressing a few buttons, civilizations always had a powerful need to transmit information. 
Consider Pheidippides, the Greek messenger who ran 26 miles to deliver vital messages during the Persian Wars. Uh, we tend to think today that uh, the story of Philippides uh, running from uh, uh, Marathon to Athens in order to uh, deliver his message, rejoice, rejoice, we have won, after which he just suddenly died. We tend to think that this story is just uh, a nice uh, uh, literary invention or creation. Why? Because we just have basically one, uh, one source, one author, Lucianus of Samosata, uh, speaking of this centuries after the Battle of Marathon uh, had happened. Whether true tale or tall tale, the founders of the modern Olympic Games created the Marathon, a foot race of 26 miles in his honor. The distance cover is exactly corresponding to the length of a modern marathon that then inspired De Coubertin and other European patrons to start the first modern Olympic Games where the marathon was an important competition. Eventually, there was an even faster way to send a message. For those who could afford it or had the know-how, there was airmail. It is believed that the ancient Persians were the first to train birds to carry messages. Pigeons were among the birds used for this purpose. However, homing pigeons had their limitations, such as only flying one way. And whatever the message, it had to be small enough to be written on a tiny piece of paper or the pigeon couldn't carry it. Ironically, even modern communications have their limitations. For example, the limit for one SMS message is 160 characters. Of course, the speed of delivering an SMS message is a bit faster than that of a pigeon. Alphabetic script and language remains to this day the primary means, whether it's on a smartphone or handwritten piece of paper, typewritten on a blog, that it remains the most immediate and effective means of communication and sending a message. Of course, technology factors into that, and there may be anomalies throughout human history, whether that means by using animal services, such as the so-called the homing pigeon, or whether it's using other acoustical devices, the beating of war drums, or other visual devices, raising of flags, different colored flags, especially at great distances. When you want to send a message, uh, to somebody you need to be uh, effective so you want this message to reach the person you want to reach with that very fast this is the reason why uh, runners were trained especially in uh, ancient uh, greece uh, but also in uh, in rome so that they could uh, take the message and uh, uh, deliver the message uh, on time uh, to uh, the person who was uh, waiting for the, the message itself the more expensive way was by horseback. Humans were much cheaper and expendable than employing a rider with a horse. That brings up a couple of different issues. One is technology and the other is economy. While human couriers were cheaper, were more economically viable, in the long term they were not the most advantageous for achieving such goals. From ancient time, horses were used to pull wagons and carry people. As with most advances in civilization, once someone engaged in an activity, everyone eventually would want to participate.
Messengers on horseback could transport news and letters from place to place. All that was required was a good horse, a good horseman, and a bit of coordination. The U.S. Postal Service. It requires a bit of coordination as well. According to their website, over 149 billion pieces of mail were delivered by the United States Postal Service in 2017. But how did we get to this point? When did postal services begin to develop? There is this important royal road uh, in the Persian Empire at the time of uh, King Darius I, uh, a road connecting uh, Susa uh, in the south uh, to Sardis in the north, in what is nowadays uh, uh, Turkey in Anatolia. It was meant to provide fast connections and communication between the major capitals of the Persian Empire. Because within the Persian Empire, there was not just one capital, there were four and then five different capitals. So obviously, it was extremely important for different reasons to maintain good communications. Relay rider networks became a common feature of every ancient empire worth its salt. They were almost exclusively for use by the government or military. The Romans, being as practical as they were, sought to perfect these networks. We tend to think that we are so sophisticated that in the modern time, our postal service, our means of communication are so fast that we cannot possibly be rivaled by what's happening in the ancient world. But one of the most interesting little snippets, I think, is Cato. Cato walks into the Senate and basically triggers the Third Punic War by presenting to the senators a casket of figs. Now that might not seem to us particularly interesting, but he reminds us that those figs are fresh and they've just come from Carthage. A cargo has moved across the Mediterranean within three days, less than three days, which means that Carthage, the main enemy of Rome, could be here within three days. So if we talk about the transport of produce, the transport of information can be even quicker. Of course, the cursus publicus, the Roman post, would not have been so efficient were it not for another example of Roman technology their famous roads. A very careful system to make sure that the center of the empire, Rome, was connected to the provinces via an efficient and reliable postal system, as we would call it today. So the cursus publicus is, in a certain sense, the example of a public postal system. In the Roman world, it was definitely the emperor, but also governors and all the members of the ruling elite had access to this system. The Romans were great road builders and the armies are constantly on the march. The armies take messages. The merchants who follow the army, the suppliers of the army, the suppliers of food stuff, are constantly taking messages backwards and forwards. So there's a great turning of Rome. In fact, there's probably more or just as much movement in the ancient world as there is today. Messages from one military camp to another, from one general to a general's subordinates, etc. At the same time, 
everything else in a society will follow from that, bring it forward to footprints of these ancient civilizations and paradigms that we see today. This is exactly the same reason, motive that the Autobahn in Germany developed on the European continent or the interstate system developed under President Eisenhower in the United States of America following World War II, primarily for military purposes, followed by communication for the military, and then every other kind of communication after that. Roman roads were the information superhighway of their time. We'll learn more about Roman roads later. For now, let's get back to the early fundamentals of human communications. To do that, we must follow the footprints of civilization back to the beginning, the real beginning, a long, long time before computers could read anyone's mind. The ability to speak probably would happen in the prehistorical time, maybe in the Paleolithic period already, they could articulate some words, they could articulate some sort of primitive thoughts. And uh, with the Homo sapiens, we can see this uh, also from the shape of uh, the skulls of these uh, homines, of these men. So uh, their skull uh, is much more larger than it used to be before. This means that their abilities in uh, terms of uh, communicating, speaking, and or also uh, in terms of thinking uh, would actually develop and increase. The next giant leap forward was the invention of writing. Some of the first writing was more like another familiar form of today's communication. These days, we routinely send each other pictorials, sometimes in a message over Snapchat, or even just an emoji in an email. Ancient Sumerians, Babylonians, and Egyptians also routinely used pictorials to communicate. The first written languages appeared only about 4,000 years ago. They were all partly pictorial, telling stories through images, but graphemes, or alphabetic letters, were also developing. This is cuneiform script. This, Akkadian script. Here, an example of classical Sumerian script. It is generally accepted that these were the world's first written languages. And, as this computer-generated reconstruction of Babylon suggests, Language enabled people to communicate and coordinate their efforts, enabling them to create incredible leaps in building that can be held to our modern standards of design and construction. We have different testimonies coming also from the subsequent Mesopotamian civilizations like the Babylonian civilization with the Code of Hammurabi. Uh, where you, uh, you have this code with uh, more than uh, uh, 200 rules inscribed on this uh, very hard uh, black uh, stone uh, where uh, you have the representation of uh, Hammurabi and receiving the rules uh, from the uh, god uh, Shamash. Egyptian hieroglyphics. They were and are amazing. They're a unique alphabet with over 1,000 characters. After the last pharaoh and the sunset of the Egyptian world, hieroglyphics were no longer used. As a result, in only a few centuries, their meaning was forgotten. We admire these drawings as incredible works of art, but for the longest time, no one really knew what they meant. Like the Sphinx at Giza herself, the meaning of hieroglyphics was a secret. Instant translation devices, including Google Translate. These days you can make yourself understood just about anywhere you go. Now the linguistically challenged need not be at a complete disadvantage when they're abroad. It wasn't always like that. In ancient days, there were no Wi-Fi connections to complain about. 
And while classical scholars were able to understand other ancient scripts, Egyptian hieroglyphics remained a mystery. They were beautiful, yes, but what did they mean by all those birds and eyes and canes and ducks and bugs and birds with the faces of men? Nobody really knew. It would have been a very select few, and particularly the religious caste and class in ancient Egyptian society that could read or interpret hieroglyphics. That they would then communicate to the mass of people. Maybe people would have recognized the head of a falcon and understood looking at the face of an obelisk, seeing this repeated pattern that that is in fact the god of the sun, Horus. The advent, again bringing these ancient civilizations and looking at their footprints today, is the advent of the emoji. Now, masses of people are using pictograms, glyphs, very much like ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. At the same time, more and more in the so-called smart device culture, people are communicating using glyphs and now not using any longer an alphabetic script language. You can think of this as a bit like computer coding. These days it is everywhere and we have become dependent on it. But how many people could actually write a computer code? To most of us, computer coding language may still be as imperceptible as hieroglyphic. But in terms of reading and writing, world literacy statistics are, happily, on the rise all the time. It's been estimated that a couple of hundred years ago, less than 20% of the world's population could read and write. These days, less than 20% are estimated to be illiterate. It may come as a surprise to know that even in the land of hieroglyphics, ancient Egypt, there were ordinary people who could read and write. In the ruins of an ancient Egyptian town called Setmat, the place of truth, tablets have been discovered which preserve the stories of the townspeople. They recorded their thoughts and stories on pieces of pottery, such as these. Some of what they wrote was highly personal and proves that some things don't change. In every civilization, people have always shared their thoughts and feelings. But with the advent of reading and writing, they were enabled to do so as never before. So you can't really say that putting the intimate details of people onto social media is something new. The ancients had the same concept, but used a different medium. One big problem with using hieroglyphics is that while beautiful to look at, they require too much time to generate. Someone needed to come up with something easier to create written communication. And eventually, someone did. In what is today the country of Lebanon, the prosperous Phoenician civilization developed an alphabet regarded as the precursor of all Western alphabets. The invention of the alphabet is one of the greatest innovation in how human communication was made possible. Obviously, writing had been known to previous civilization, but it's only when the Phoenicians came up with what is considered the first alphabetical system that writing and then reading became more and more accessible to larger groups of people. A pictogram is set and cannot say anything other than that pictogram, whereas a word and the association of the word can, can move 
Um, we can make a word singular, we can make a word plural, we can decline a verb, we can do things with words that we can't do in pictograms. We can say in a pictogram house, but we can't say houses without doing two images of houses. Entering the house, we haven't any verbs in pictograms. It's impossible to assign an exact date, but the earliest surviving Phoenician inscription is the Ahiram epitaph at Byblos. It is around 10,000 years old. In this close-up view, do the letters of the Phoenician alphabet seem oddly familiar? It's because this ancient alphabet was the forerunner of the Latin alphabet, which in essence we still use today. In a certain sense, this is true with the introduction of uh, emoticons. In a certain sense, we go back to a more pictorial expression. Instead of saying, I'm mad, you have that little angry face and you are reverting back to a pictorial writing. Nevertheless, I think that once you have the control of the alphabetical writing for more articulate thoughts, it's difficult to fully revert to just a pictorial system. Modern technology demands fast communication and it means that language is often reduced to pictograms, memes or indeed English abbreviated, you becoming just a single alphabet word, you. And that's happening across language in general. We're finding a lot of languages coming into difficulty because they don't allow themselves for easy texting. Um, I'm not sure that similar phenomenon was happening in the ancient world, but we certainly find a difference between the spoken language of the streets which was abbreviated and the written language of high society or indeed the literary forms. Once the new alphabet was out there, communications could be generated faster. The bandwidth had changed with this new user-friendly alphabet and so the written language really began to take off. The Greeks chose to adapt the alphabet and use it to express themselves in miraculous ways. Examples include the great tomes in the canons of ancient Greek writings, the great tales of the Odyssey and the Iliad by Homer, the writings of Plato, Aristotle, and many more like them. But in their early life, even great texts, such as the Iliad and the Odyssey, started out exclusively oral. In fact, based on our current concept of general authorship, Homer never physically wrote those pieces. He is, however, considered the composer of these tales. Another author I find particularly relevant for the impact it had with his work is Herodotus. He is considered the father of history because his work represents a full account of the Persian Wars. Highbrow to lowbrow, show business. Here it's all about escapism and adventure, drama and realism, all mixed together, creating a big business with box office that's always booming. You could argue that part of entertainment today is derived from the gladiatorial arenas of ancient Rome. Only in the Roman version, the blood and guts were real. The Greeks used the arena to entertain people in a different way. They created the arena of theater. The drama communicated by the Greeks in arenas such as these has withstood the test of time. 
The magnificence of the theaters and their locations shows how important the theater was to the Greeks. Those slanting limestone seats made for a great low-tech acoustic sound system. You could be at the Hollywood Bowl. The great figures of Greek drama, Antigone, Oedipus Rex, Prometheus, Medea, were a 50-50 split between men and women. Such an egalitarian approach demonstrates another way in which the Greeks may have been ahead of their time. Greek theater, storytelling, catharsis. Just think how much we owe the Greeks. Humans are the storytelling animal, as it is said. Theater provided an opportunity to let one's emotions out. And that, then as now, could be therapeutic. in times of crisis. If you needed to send out a message quickly during times of war or rebellion or natural disaster, what methods were available to you in the year 540 BCE? All ancient cultures, including those beyond the Mediterranean, used smoke signals, when visibility allowed, to send messages across longer distances. By covering a fire with a blanket, then by opening the fire uh, again, you can actually create uh, puffs of, uh, of smoke, so you can create uh, signals by using the fire and the smoke themselves. The relaying of messages using beacons and lit torches planted on hilltops was a very common method of delivery. But of course, this method was only good for conveying particular prearranged signals, such as a signal indicating danger or victory. When you have a smoke sign, sometimes it can also be detected and uh, decoded or encoded by your enemy, so this is true. But there were you know, specific uh, techniques uh, whose aim or whose goal was uh, that of uh, avoiding this fact. I mean, uh, so uh, probably your generals could decide to put the fire on a specific place, on a specific uh, hill or mountains, uh, for example, that was hidden from uh, the view of, uh, of your enemy. So there were specific uh, kind of uh, techniques that would uh, make uh, the possibility to be uh, detected or discovered uh, less probable, but of course, uh, that was not impossible for the enemy to detect your uh, um, uh, messages. To culminate the selection of a new pope as part of the papal conclave, the modern-day College of Cardinals in Rome uses smoke signals. The smoke signal is sent when, after secret balloting, one cardinal has received a vote of two-thirds plus one. The ballots are burned after each vote. Black smoke signals an inconclusive ballot. The appearance of white smoke means a new pope has been chosen by the cardinals. In the ancient world, there were only a few alphabets circulating, all jostling for attention. But of course, the alphabet that spread the fastest and furthest was the Roman or Latin alphabet. You might hear it referred to as the English alphabet, but be assured it was the Roman Latin alphabet. Across the ancient empires, there was no homogenized language. In the Greek empire, we're talking about the time of Athens, we have a number of 
Greek languages, which are separate, um, not quite fair to call them dialects, but Greek was not standardised. The Greeks themselves called anybody who didn't speak Greek barbaroi, that is, people who tended to bleat like sheep. So anybody who didn't understand the basic tenets of Greek was considered what we call a barbarian. Within the Roman world, Latin, together with Greek, which, as I said, remain the main language in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, was a sort of a global, global in relative terms, form of communication, because people were expected to know and uh, even read basic Latin, and uh, it was a language that went beyond Rome itself and uh, helped people exchanging ideas, exchanging messages across the entire world of those days. So it would be possible to make a parallel uh, between uh, the use of uh, English that we have today and the use of Latin uh, that we had at the time of the Empire? Uh, maybe yes, probably yes. Today everybody can uh, speak uh, English. The ancient Roman Empire was vast, stretching over many territories. As a result, the empire was comprised of people with varying ethnicities speaking many different languages. But Latin was the official language of the whole empire. It was vital to speak that language for anyone seeking advancement in politics or the military. It was also the language of the law and literature. Eventually, there was a high style of Latin spoken by the upper class and so-called vulgar Latins spoken by the poor. At the time of uh, the empire, uh, the Latin, or the classical Latin, uh, was the language employed and used uh, by the elites and among the elites. So this is the main, uh, the main difference, uh, that you had uh, different uh, styles and so also different languages. Uh, also in the time of uh, the development and spread of uh, the Latin, you had uh, classical Latin. Uh, used by writers, uh, the uh, men of letters, uh, philosophers, or politicians, uh, uh, look at uh, Caesar, for example, but you also uh, had uh, what is called, uh, or what is known as uh, the vulgar Latin, uh, the sermo vulgaris, uh, employed uh, uh, maybe in a more archaic uh, phase of the, the development of uh, the Latin, uh, and uh, also later uh, spoken uh, the level of the people. Under the Roman Empire, particularly under the Eastern Roman Empire, Greek was the official language. Any communication that was done, any official documentation, was communicated in Greek, not in Latin. But the dictates of the empire were communicated or set up in towns in great Latin inscriptions. Now whether these Latin inscriptions were ever understood by a native population is very much doubted later of the empire and then uh, towards uh, the end of the Roman civilization and with the shift uh, to uh, the early medieval uh, times, uh, you have uh, the birth of uh, uh, national identities and languages uh, step by step throughout the Middle Ages. The church will uh, develop and will flourish uh, on a Roman basis, uh, so uh, the church will uh, acquire and will uh, reuse uh, both uh, the uh, territorial structures of uh, the Roman Empire, uh, but also the linguistical and the cultural structure of the Roman Empire, which were represented by uh, the Latin culture, basically. So the Latin will become the official language of the church, as it used to be the official language of the Roman Empire. Veni vidi vici, I came, I saw, I conquered, Julius Caesar. E pluribus unum, out of many, one, Heraclitus. In vino veritas, in wine there is truth, Pliny the Elder. And carpe diem, seize the day, the poet Horace. All Latin phrases from the days of the Roman Empire, each still in use to this very day. Sometimes the footprints of civilization can be found on the tip of your tongue. When we choose to tune in to news these days, we know we have multiple sources, each with their own political view. It wasn't quite like that in ancient Rome, but the seeds of the communication revolution were definitely there. 
The Acta Diurna was effectively the world's first newspaper. This daily news sheet, printed on papyrus, was distributed at first in the Roman capital and then in different versions across the empire. The Acta Diurna are the daily deeds, the Acta Deeds Diurna Daily. These were notices placed in the forum to let a literate public be aware of what's going on. Primarily they were dissemination of laws, military news, but increasingly other types of general information were included, births, deaths, marriages. Um, because Rome was very much a superstitious society, um, we also have zodiacal readings put in, so basically your stars were actually included. The astrologically, for those who are astrologically interested, would find that their, um, their daily stars, their daily horoscope, were sometimes proclaimed. In a certain sense, it's a form of early newspaper, and it was uh, published under the patronage of the emperor. In a certain sense, it was a way to keep the people updated. We know, however, that in the ancient world, the news spread also very quickly orally. Of course, the accuracy of the original content might get diluted, but we know that this kind of exchange, let's say, in the Roman Forum or at the bathhouse was really the most important way through which people kept themselves informed on what was going on. And that explains why apparently Romans were wasting so much time hanging around in the forum or spending long hours in the bathhouse. It's even the Acta Diurna, they did not circulate as wide as a modern newspaper, not to speak about TV today. The Acta Diurna, again, communication, messaging, propaganda, perhaps, is official. It's the government, it's state. Those who could read it would read it. Those who couldn't would ask those who could read it to read it. Did they trust them? Word of mouth, always communication, word of mouth. How did word of mouth really spread, for example, in ancient Rome with the daily news? Always communication, but one of two ways. Oral, verbal, gossip, or written graffiti, as we understand graffiti today. In August 2018, the Washington Post reported that a team of Danish economists had made a compelling case that roadways built by the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago strongly correlated with present-day prosperity. Carl Johann Dahlgaard of the University of Copenhagen argued a causal link between ancient road building and modern day prosperity. He and his team took into account modern day road and population density and even satellite imagery of nighttime lighting in Europe overlaid on maps of the old Roman ways. You see, all roads really do lead to Rome. the societies that flourished around the Mediterranean in the Classical period. They created the alphabet we use today, which gave us words of wisdom that were written down and passed on through generations. Written communication uh, is uh, very important uh, because uh, it gives us a precise idea of our uh, roads. The fact that a word is written down and is no longer has to be memorized, but can be consulted in an archive, can be filed away, becomes a, and becomes a permanent record, has such a profound effect. But what would the people of the great civilizations be without communication? Considering that even animals have a form of communication, removing communication from the range of human activities would make mankind close to maybe stones. Deaf to hearing other humans, mute to speak with other humans, and ultimately cold to be a human.
Art has the undeniable power to change minds, to enlighten and reveal the unexpected. When future generations look at the art of the 20th and 21st centuries, what will they make of it? And the society that created it? In other words, what will they make of us? Thousands of years after they were created, the great works of art still have influential power. In this episode, we will explore the artistic footprints of civilization that we see right in front of us today. Winston Churchill once said, history is written by the victors. That sounds predictably one-sided. But the art that civilizations have left behind tells us a great deal about the ancient worlds of the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans. The concept of art as something that has to do with creativity, inspiration, personal expression, and so on, which is more or less all the concepts that we generally associate with the term art nowadays. Art is ultimately and fundamentally expression of everything that is humanity aspires to be, that humanity regrets being. Art is humanity's memory of the past and its aspiration and desire for the future. The first art, in parentheses, dates back 26 to 30,000 years ago and is found in cave drawings in southwestern France and in northwestern Spain, such places as Lascaux and Neo. In those places, the drawers, who are master drawers, drew figures of rampant animals, for example, but they also, secondly, drew, put their hands on the walls and drew around their hands. They are saying to themselves and to others, here is the world we live in. I don't think you can find one overarching theme, and I think it's probably more useful to think in terms of visual culture than art as such because art implies a certain type of value, whereas really they're using visual images for different reasons. These objects, artifacts, uh, that we very often use and refer to as art, uh, had normally very different functions in the pre-modern times, not exclusively aesthetic ones, but functions such as social, political, religious, and so on. In many cases where, especially where there is no written sources, uh, that were left from particular periods, those artifacts are sometimes exclusively available to us for understanding habits uh, and civilization of the ancients. When we look at the great civilizations of the ancient Mediterranean world, what do we see? What speaks to us? Nothing spans the centuries in quite the same way as the art of ancient Egypt, Greece, Rome, and others. Can we not catch a glimpse of ourselves in these relics from the distant past? These footprints of civilization still give pleasure today. Where does the artistic impulse begin? Perhaps at its core, it is simply the desire to express, I was here, I existed. The Chauvet cave paintings in southern France, the artists who made them around 30,000 years ago came from the fine drafts people. The paintings display a terrific sense of movement. Early on, they start with visual images of one particular part of themselves, which is what we call hand stencils, which is the idea of putting your hand up against the wall and then they would spit paint onto it so you get an outline of the hand.
What is extraordinary about this is that it has a, a very wide geographical basis to it. You find it in Indonesia, in South America, in Africa. You find all over the idea of copying your handprint in this way. And some people have wondered, is this really the start of human consciousness, of this idea that I am a person and I am here? and this is me. Some claim that they had some magical function so that they were meant as a way of reassuring themselves that for example they when they go hunting that the hunt will be successful or that maybe these drawings also had healing purposes and so on and so forth. Uh, whatever the reason was those initial drawings were also can be perceived as a form of communication. It's often said that the early animal depictions are to do with hunting, but actually archaeological evidence doesn't entirely bear that out. When we come to examine the diet of early human beings, we find that those were not actually the animals that they were eating. It may not be they were hunting them, it may be they had another significance for them. And they look at animals and see some very good qualities that animals may have that maybe we don't have uh, today. They can see animals as being brave, animals as being fierce. So this tells us that man always created the representation of the art to speak to him. And that's why people in antiquity, and maybe modern people too, speak to statues, for example pray to statues. They're not asking that matter speak to them, but they're asking that that concept speak to them. And so art is the continuation and the further development of our communication systems. Tens of thousands of years after the first caveman began drawing on wall, human beings still leave their mark whenever they can. The tools and instruments may have changed, but the impulse and the concept remains the same. Let's go back in history more than 5,000 years when the ancient Egyptians were painting and carving some of the most incredible works of art the world has ever seen. An unmistakable style. The bust of Nefertiti. She ruled ancient Egypt, mostly as a co-regent, but was for a time its sole ruler. She was at the center of an enormous change in Egyptian religion and politics. This is one of the most iconic pieces of art to survive from ancient Egypt. Her face is practically symmetrical, flawless. What for most people stands out in specifically Egyptian art, sculpture, or other visual imagery, drawing, is that it's very static, and some suggest that this is precisely to evoke a sense of the divine. Perhaps it is a foreshadowing of an idea that the divine is not merely beyond the physical, but that there is some sort of incarnation in the human of the divine. We certainly have some very idealized features, but we also have some that are clearly not idealized. I think they chose the image they wanted for a specific purpose, and the purpose was to give a representation of the person, of the most important aspect of the person. Did Nefertiti really look so beautiful? Was she so flawless? Probably, possibly not, but maybe that's how she appeared to them. The idealization as a method of de depiction 
is not something that was meant necessarily just to give a stylized representation of a concrete human being, but also something that was meant to depict a principle, which is something that appears in the form of a concrete human being, but it also represents something that is much more apersonal or something that surpasses concrete individual appearance. The pharaohs and queens of Egypt guarded their images carefully. How about women in power today? Unlike men in power, women still feel a pressure to display and maintain a public face. Their images are retouched and perfected in Photoshop in order to match contemporary perceptions of beauty. Nefertiti's bust was created by the court sculptor Tutmosa. It is believed she actually posed for this bust as the artist's model in his studio. We know very, very little about the sculptors or any of the artists who made the Egyptian art that we see today. And this is the only example that we have of an actual artist studio. But we don't know if he was famous in his own day, in his own town. These uh, architects or sculptors or painters were not treated uh, in a special way in the ancient Egypt or some other ancient civilizations because they have some talents or because they have something to express in the same sense in which we expect that from artists nowadays. The reason why they had special position was more similar to the special position of scientists. Uh, they have special position, they are paid well because they produce something that within our society or in the ancient uh, Egyptian society was special, was treated as something that uh, an ordinary person cannot do. Nefertiti, like other pharaohs and queens, was instrumental in the creation of ambitious building and arts projects. Consider the Sphinx at Giza, the pyramids in the Valley of the Kings. All of these were commissioned by Egyptian royalty. Old textbooks used to have this idea of the pharaohs as bringing in loads of slaves and kind of whipping them into doing this. But we now don't really believe that that was so. We believe that probably people gave their time, that they considered it to be part almost of their tax. They may even have felt that there was some honour attached to building this pyramid or building these monumental temples. And so they are doing it at times when they're not at home farming. They go and give their time, give their expertise. And that's quite interesting. Why would people do that? And it comes down really to the figure of the leader. Of course, if you were an Egyptian pharaoh, such as Khufu, builder of the Great Pyramid at Giza, money really was no object. The laborers who did the heavy lifting were paid in food and beer. But those same laborers also believed that helping to build the pyramids guaranteed them a place in the afterlife. In Egyptian art, the importance of religion cannot be overstated. The connection between their religion and art never changed. The greatest pieces of art from the Renaissance were also inspired by faith. Pieces created by Michelangelo, Donatello, and Leonardo da Vinci. Indeed, with over 2,000 identified deities, the Egyptians had a god or goddess for everything. While there was one supreme deity, Ra, the sun god, 
There were gods for mummification, wine and beer, childbirth, war, and many, many more. There were the hawk-headed gods, Horus and Ra. There was Sobek with his crocodile head. As you can see, the Egyptians really let their imaginations run wild. There is a significant amount of anthropomorphizing, that is, rendering human or partially human, because humans look to the more noble elements, virtues, qualities that these things possess. The strength, the power of a lion, for example. They were expressing the unity of nature, that man had a particular role which he shared other species, a broader species, uh, in life. Uh, part of it is dependent food supply or animals which are utilitarian. Others of it are emotional. For example, they presented uh, cats. There are cats everywhere in Egyptian art. We could say that's emotional, possibly. The footprints of civilization reveal themselves in unexpected ways. There's something strangely familiar about the half-human, half-beast Egyptian deities with supernatural abilities. Hollywood has, to a certain extent, subverted that by making that bestiality into something heroic and perhaps implying that we might have that inside ourselves as well. Maybe we also have the ability to be super strong or climb buildings. But instead of using those qualities in a bestial way, which is what has worried philosophers up till now, perhaps we can use them in a superhero way. But the art of ancient Egypt surprises us in many ways. Realism started to emerge in the art of the later period of ancient Egypt. This is the so-called Boston Green Head. It's not a work by Marcel Duchamp or Louise Bourgeois. This sculptured head of an Egyptian priest is from the 4th century BCE, the so-called late period of ancient Egypt. These days, it resides in a reinforced glass case in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, a long way from where it was created. Despite being around 2,400 years old, it looks like it could have been sculpted in the last 100 years. We're so used to stylized and formal portraits of Egyptians, yet this is a portrait of a man, not of a god. He has wrinkles on his face and what looks to be a wart on one cheek, and he is definitely overweight. We can see that they were depictions of some individual personalities, but at the same time help us quickly associate them with Egyptian art and Egyptian culture. So in a certain sense, both heads show us how an artist or sculptor in this particular period can approach his or her subject from the point of view of making a realistic depiction, but importing at the same time certain principles of stylization We'll double back to those civilizations around the Mediterranean that rose up after Egypt's decline. But now, we jump forward in time to see how influential the art of antiquity has been to the present. The modern-day Renaissance man or woman, or to be inclusive, Renaissance person, they are cultured, sophisticated, and have polysyllabic titles after their name, like writer, musician, artist, for example. Viggo Mortensen is a perfect example. He's not only a celebrated actor, he also paints, writes poetry, and fluently speaks Danish, French, Spanish, and English. And in so many ways, the actual Renaissance of the 14th to 17th centuries was about the discovery of ancient works of art. If we're thinking about what constitutes a Renaissance person, if we think about 
the origin of the term. The great thing about the Renaissance was that people spanned the arts and the sciences. So people could be an artist and an architect and examine nature. They could write and paint. And there is something about that broad span of knowledge, which I think brings knowledge in itself in seeing connections. As we've gone on through time, we've tended to specialise a lot. The Apollo of Belvedere. After centuries of neglect, it was found in the 15th century and today resides in the Vatican. It was most likely carved by Leo Caris, the favourite sculptor of Alexander the Great. It was one of the most admired Greek sculptures during the Renaissance. It was immediately recognized upon its discovery in the late 1400s in Rome as a long lost perfect example of the classical ideals, symmetry, balance, perfection, both physically in sculpture as well as in symbolism, in interpretation, the classical ideal of beauty, the aesthetic principle, and particularly perhaps the human ideal, what it means to be the perfect human. The Riachi Bronzes, also Greek, discovered in the 1970s by an amateur scuba diver off the Calabrian coast. And finally, La Ocoon and his sons. It depicts a priest of Apollo and his two sons in their death throes as they are slain by serpents. Has there ever been a greater artistic study of human suffering? La Ocoon is an interesting character in Greek mythology. He was a Trojan priest. He was a priest who was very suspicious of the wooden horse and he tried to persuade the Trojans not to bring the wooden horse into Troy. And this angered the gods because, of course, they had determined that the Greeks would win the Trojan War. So it was said he was going against the will of the gods. And in order to punish him for that, a sea serpent was sent to drag him into the sea and kill him. But what is tragic about the story is that it's not just him, it's his two young sons. The ancient Greek sculptors were truly great craftsmen and artists. Yet somehow, in later centuries, so much of their artistry and technique would be forgotten. Just compare the realism of these artworks with the art of the Middle Ages in the centuries before the Renaissance. Medieval art has a power and a certain charm of its own. But since ancient times, the draftsmanship, sense of proportion, and incredible technique have all seemed to have denigrated through the centuries. Why the great leap backwards? Rather than looking at these styles as progression of one style and its decline, we nowadays prefer to think of them as separate styles that should be judged on their own terms. So instead of comparing particular aspects from the ancient Greek or Roman style that they were using and then saying how good or bad medieval art is compared to these standards, of course, in ancient Greece, much of the artwork depicted the gods. In contrast with Egypt, the Greek gods, reduced from thousands to a mere baker's dozen, were only depicted in human forms. And they all lived on Mount Olympus, except Hades of the underworld, who was the 13th. Though Greek gods were immortal and had superhuman powers, they weren't necessarily great role models. 
The Greek gods were anything but well-behaved. They were one big unhappy family, constantly squabbling and having ill-advised sex. They could be childish, vindictive, and petty. Probably the most impetuous and infantile of all the gods would be the chief head of the gods in the Greek pantheon, namely Zeus, exhibiting probably the least virtuous traits that any human being could possess, that of jealousy, that of rage, that of allowing those kinds of passions to do harm to others. Similar in nature to the Greek gods, many of today's celebrities and their culture are notable for their tantrums, bad habits, and messy personal lives. Too many are famous for being famous and not for legitimate achievements. Art has always conferred prestige on its big money patrons. The art world of today is really big business. People with very deep pockets pay incredible sums for works by artists who, at the time of creating that art, might have struggled just to feed themselves. It is believed that Van Gogh was only able to sell one of his paintings while he lived. And yet, a century after he painted it, Van Gogh's portrait of Dr. Gachet sold for $82 million. What about the artists of the ancient world? Were they mere servants or glorified tradespeople? Did any of them get to be rich while they lived? This is the Aphrodite of Nidos, a sculpture by the Greek artist Praxiteles. One of the things that Praxiteles was particularly admired for in his depiction of Aphrodite was the flesh, because female flesh is very soft. And so to make the, the statue convincing of being a fully sexualized woman, you would have to render that soft flesh. And that's very, very difficult to do in marble. Male flesh, for example, in a marble statue, you can make a male statue look muscular and hard by polishing. But to make such a hard substance look convincing as female flesh is very much more difficult. Artists like Praxiteles, who were freed from the expected obedience to an emperor or state, were able to express themselves with impunity. Sometimes that meant breaking with the official line in order to make a statement. It didn't matter if their work made people uncomfortable or not. The Athenians were rich enough to sponsor great works of art and architecture. What rich means in the ancient world is not exactly what it means today because we live in a money economy and they did not. They probably received the high honors of the community. In the Greek world, these people were honored very highly for their uh, techne, their art, but not as art. What they were doing is giving figuration and life to Greek beliefs. This was very superior kind of workmanship but that they did not consider it as quite as we did as art. The Parthenon in Athens, part of the Acropolis complex, a temple to the goddess Athena, built after the Athenian victory in the Persian Wars. The statue of Athena has long since disappeared from the Parthenon. It was removed by the Romans, who probably melted it down. But a replica of Athena is housed thousands of miles away in Nashville, Tennessee. The footprints of civilization show up in all kinds of places. It is, as you can see, very colorful, with ruby red lips and sky blue eyes. She's robed, carrying a richly decorated shield and spear, and she wears a gold helmet. What's going on here? Is it artistic license taken to an extreme? The answer might surprise you. One of the great shocks, I think, to a contemporary audience is the idea that these wonderful white marble statues and the temples were, in fact, painted. In 2018, a traveling exhibition called Gods in Color 
polychromy in the ancient world created equal parts excitement and disbelief. Here were some of the most famous sculptures of antiquity in glorious color. We are so used to seeing the sculptures of the ancient world in cool white marble. That's been the accepted view since the Renaissance when these works were rediscovered. But it turns out that after centuries of exposure to the elements, the vast majority of the statues and sculptures lost their original paint. The artists of the time copied what they saw, leaving their stone sculptures unpainted. Just think of Michelangelo's statue of David, for instance, white marble perfection. For many people, actually, it would be very shocking to see these sculptures the way ancient Greeks or Romans would see them in an everyday context. So they would be kind of ancient Greek or Roman versions of photoshopped images. They would actually use their paintings and their sculpture to produce images that would be visually appealing, including those details that for many people would seem very strange, sometimes you can see them also in museums. People are shocked and I very often hear that also from my students that they call it kitsch. But if there was one ancient civilization above all that would be best seen in glorious technicolor, it was ancient Rome. From the earliest days of Hollywood, there was always something cinematic about the epic grandeur of Rome. Of course, day-to-day -day life would have been a lot less colorful for the average citizen. Some of our viewers may remember this cultural moment. Do you remember when pop music lovers had to make a choice between the Rolling Stones or the Beatles? You couldn't really be a fan of both. Art historians can be similarly polarized when it comes to the art of ancient Greece and Rome. Greek art and sculpture have been revered for centuries and considered an early pinnacle of human artistic achievement. Roman art, on the other hand, is often seen as a pale imitation. Though it's always been acknowledged that the Romans were exceptional builders. But then, art is part design, part craft, and sometimes part technology, as is the case with these mighty works of architecture. This is the Pantheon in Rome. It was built to the design of Apollodorus of Damascus. And it's as magnificent as Brunelleschi's dome in Florence, built well over 1,000 years later during the Renaissance. The footprints of civilization have always reached for the sky. It's something that really impresses us. But I don't think in itself statistics make a building influential. If the building doesn't work as a building, we're not going to just be impressed by people telling us the width and the height, etc. It's got to actually impact our senses. And that's where the Pantheon really comes into its own. Because every time you go into the Pantheon, it's like you're going into it for the first time. It's different. It's different at every hour of the day. It's different with the weather. It's different with the month of the year. It's different with the light. It's an extraordinary building. The Pantheon, Greek word meaning to all the gods, a temple dedicated to all the gods, was in fact never intended in its current form in the early second century to be dedicated to all the gods. Rather, the Pantheon, constructed under the Roman Emperor Hadrian in the early second century was intentionally designed to be dedicated to one god, that god being the god of the sun. Because at the time, Rome was already moving towards monotheism. Why? Because monotheism, borrowed from ancient Egypt, in Rome justified the consolidation of complete power into the hands of one, namely the emperor. In terms of its engineering and architecture, a perfectly symmetrical 360 degree sphere or circle. Again, symbol of the divine in itself. It's also, interestingly enough, so well built, it still has the widest dome in the world. 
It's never been exceeded. Although in height there have been many other domes that have been exceed that are much higher. The dome is so well constructed that it has never cracked in a city that's had major earthquakes. But the Pantheon has never come down. The dome has never cracked. It, it has multiple engineering architectural features that are, are still unique today. To create a dome that size at any time in history without internal supports is an extraordinary achievement. So all these building techniques, it's uh, the design, the proportions, the very careful mathematical calculations that enabled this architecture uh, were very something that, that fascinated uh, people throughout the ages. The influence cast by the Dome of the Pantheon can be seen across the planet, from Santa Sofia in Istanbul and throughout the Islamic world. Its influence is seen in modern America and the iconic architectural world wonder, the Taj Mahal. The grandeur of Rome is well known, but the mighty temples, parliaments, and public spaces tell only one side of the story. What about art on a smaller scale? The art that well-to-do merchants might have used to decorate their homes. Were the Romans house proud? Did the wealthy see their homes as reflections and extensions of their good taste and place in society? Today's strata of those leading the lifestyle of the rich and famous have multi-million dollar homes and no end to their pride. There was a time when famous rock and R&B musicians were considered part of the counterculture. Now, however, they're proud to show off their homes and possessions for the cameras. The Romans reveled in luxury and conspicuous consumption they would likely have loved lifestyle television shows. These are wall paintings in the house of Lucretius Fronto of Pompeii. They depict morality tales and episodes from Roman mythology. This was, of course, a wealthy man's villa, which was attached to land. It was a far reach from the everyday Roman citizen. Probably it was very important for people like him to demonstrate to the world that he too had a good education. Romans wanted everybody to understand position in society and their level of education. And so they decorated their houses with stories from the myths, in stories from the Trojan War, in historical references and references to gods and goddesses. One of the things that we realise is that even quite poor people or people quite far down the social ladder could afford to have their houses painted. It was not just for the elite. It was a very visual society, in fact. Very visual, very polychrome, highly colored. We will probably never know precisely what all of these wall panels mean, but it's reasonable to assume that this residence would have been considered, at the time, highly stylish. And of course, some of the best preserved Roman art was literally underfoot the footprints of civilization were laid down in mosaics. 
these cubes of stone, ceramic, and glass were arranged precisely to form vivid, colorful, and intricate designs. Mosaics were more than decoration, for they told stories often packed with drama and violence. No emperor reflects drama and violence quite like the Roman Emperor Augustus, depicted in this statue. With or without color, it's everything that we expect of a Roman emperor. Strong, relatively youthful, and all-conquering. There's a message here, and not a particularly subtle one. The Romans, of course, were masters of what is referred to today as the dark arts, propaganda. This particular image of Augustus was spread throughout the Roman Empire, unchanged for the 40 or so years of his reign as emperor. Octavian came to power at a very crucial moment in Roman history. There had been a republic. The republic was failing. There was violence on the streets and there was a civil war. Ultimately, the person who gains power after that is Octavian, who then becomes Augustus. Absent on Augustus are wrinkles around his eyes, a receding hairline, love handles, or stooped shoulders. He would always be depicted in top shape and form. By the time he dies, he's in his late 70s, nearly 80, but the image is still that image from before, because the important thing is that everybody understood the image, because the image is the image of restoring the Republic, whatever the reality was about how the government was run. So it's not personal vanity, it's all political with him. Everything with him was political. Augustus was undoubtedly a hard man, who took power in the wake of the assassination of Julius Caesar, but there's nothing to suggest he was insane. Some of his successors were a different story. The Roman Emperor Nero was obsessed with art. He was also just plain obsessed. Nero was well-versed in poetry and music, painting and sculpture. He sang and played the lyre. So it might even be argued that Nero was indeed the first true Renaissance emperor. It's difficult to speculate on Nero's personal talent as a performer in the dramatic arts. One, because most of what we have in the written record is negative propaganda against Nero. Secondly, however, what we can see of what remains of Nero's legacy is still visible in different areas, especially in the city of Rome and its surrounding areas, his famous Domus Aurea. And if that is itself any testimony and testament to Nero's talent, if you will, as an artist, maybe not so much a dramatic performing artist, but certainly an artist with a mind for architecture, with a mind for the aesthetic ideal. Though he was a most cultured man, Nero was also a bloodthirsty madman who had both his mother and his wife murdered. He was famous for his many acts of sickness and depravity. It may be best to remember the cultivated aristocrats of Rome who had an eye for the finer things in life. But many of them would have also regularly attended the amphitheater to watch men battle each other to death or be fed to wild animals. The difference between being cultured and or cultivated and civilized is perhaps being civilized is what any citizen of a civilization is expected to do, how they're expected to behave. And the idea of being civilized is top down. Being cultured, being cultivated, it comes from something within that the human person may struggle with, but nevertheless aspires to something loftier, to something beyond one's own limitations as a human. I think we would all like to think that you can educate people in to behaving well, but history shows us that isn't true. Some of the worst, most bloodthirsty dictators have loved art 
and collected it have often patronised the arts. It didn't mean anything. Unfortunately, these things don't go together and in fact, often I'm told that one will find that people who've made a lot of money out of criminal enterprises love to put their money into art. There's no doubt that the Roman Empire was capable of great tyranny and cruelty. It's also true that they left behind a treasure trove of incredible architecture, dazzling wall paintings, and stunning mosaics. For that, they deserve our unwavering appreciation. To this day, treasures from the ancient societies around the Mediterranean are still being unearthed. Happily, they're more accessible to us than ever. The roots of all that we have today are somehow buried in the antiquity somewhere. The Greeks and Romans created these forms of art and their content and their sensibilities and aesthetics for us. If you've never experienced visiting the pyramids, the Parthenon, or Pompeii, you can go online to take a virtual tour of any of them. In that sense, you can easily experience the ancient world as never before. We understand art as a very complex set of human activities that come out of some creative urge. So trying to eliminate art from human history seems to me to be the same as trying to imagine human history without human beings. Anyone with an eye for today's beauty, drama, color, and lines can appreciate how the footprints of civilization show up in their everyday lives. And what are we without art? Art is the expression of, of all sorts of things, most especially leaving our, if you will, footprint for those who come after us to see that someone else has already been here has already done that. It teaches us to be self-reflective, it makes us think about ourselves, and it opens up our creativity. It affects us emotionally, it makes us respond, and we have to listen to that in order to get the most out of it.